Pacific. Now, a hearing on anti-terrorism. On Tuesday morning, a House Government Reform Subcommittee heard testimony on developing a national strategy to combat terrorism. Subcommittee Chairman Christopher Shays of Connecticut leads the three-and-a-half-hour session. A quorum being present, this, a quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Veterans Affairs and International Relations hearing entitled Combating Terrorism in Search of a National Strategy is called to order. Last week, we, we learned the stalled investigation of the Kobar Towers bombing that killed 19 Americans has been beset by a long-simmering power struggle between the FBI director and the U.S. attorney assigned to bring terrorism per perpetrators to justice. Transfer of the case to another prosecutor may breathe new life into the five-year-old inquiry, but the change is also a symptom of a suffocating problem plaguing the federal effort to combat terrorism. In a word, turf. In 1995, the President designated the Federal Emergency Management Agency as the lead federal agency for consequence management, the measures needed to protect life, restore essential services, and provide emergency relief after a terrorism event involving conventional biological, chemical, or radiological weapons of mass destruction. The FBI, part of the Department of Justice, was directed to lead crisis management, the measures needed to prevent or punish acts of terrorism. Today, more than 40 federal departments and agencies operate programs to deter, detect, prepare for, and respond to terrorist attacks. We put their names out to demonstrate how difficult it would be to get them all in one room, much less get them all to speak with one voice. While some interagency cooperation and information sharing has begun, substantial barriers, including legislative mandates, still prevent a fully coordinated counterterrorism effort. As the organizational charts get more complex, the effort inevitably becomes less cohesive. In our previous hearings, we found duplicative research programs and overlapping preparedness training, despite expenditure of more than $9 billion last year. Many local first responders still lack basic training and equipment. According to our witnesses this morning, the fight against terrorism remains fragmented and unfocused, primarily because no overarching national strategy guides planning, direct spending, or disciplines bureaucratic baltization. They will discuss recommendations for reform of counterterrorism programs. The new, in, new administration would be wise, very wise, to consider. When pressed for a national strategy, the previous administration pointed to a pastiche of event-driven presidential decision directives and an agency-specific five-year plan. Reactive in vision and scope, that strategy changed only as we lurched from crisis to crisis, from Kobar to the coal, from Oklahoma City to Dar es Salaam. In January, the subcommittee wrote to Dr. Condoleezza Rice, the President's National Security Advisor, regarding the need for a clearer national strategy to combat terrorism. The administration has begun a thorough review of current programs and policies. In deference to that review, the subcommittee will not receive testimony from executive agencies' witnesses today. They will appear at a future hearing. That hearing will be in the very near future. Terrorists willing to die for their cause will not wait while we rearrange bureaucratic boxes on the organizational chart. Their strategy is clear. Their focus is keen. Their resources efficiently deployed. Our national security demands greater strategic clarity, sharper focus, and unprecedented coordination to confront the threat of terrorism today. We look forward to the testimony of our very distinguished witnesses as we continue our oversight of these critical issues. This time I'd like to re uh, recognize uh, Dennis Kucinich, the ranking member of the committee.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. I want to welcome the witnesses. I have a prepared statement I would like inserted in the record. And just to, uh, to note that I'm hopeful that uh, as we review this uh, counterterrorism program that we would also have the opportunity to explore <coughs> causal relationships in terrorism so that we may learn why our nation feels it needs such uh, a sweeping counterterrorism presence. I thank you. I thank the gentleman. At this time, I recognize the Vice Chairman, uh, Adam Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also have a statement to submit for the record, but I appreciate your calling this hearing. And clearly, as the charts around us indicate, the national strategy against terrorism is that there is not one national strategy against terrorism. And recent events in Cobar, Oklahoma City, and a number of other places around the world have clearly indicated the need for us to further refine our efforts and our preparations for these types of acts of violence against American citizens and our interests. And I look forward to the testimony from the witnesses. Thank you. I recognize Ron Lewis from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to uh, welcome our witnesses, and uh, I'm looking forward to their testimony. And uh, this certainly is a complex problem, but uh, we certainly need to be doing uh, everything we can uh, to solve this as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before uh, calling our witnesses and swearing them in, I just want to get rid of some housekeeping here and ask unanimous consent to insert into the hearing record a statement from the General Accounting Office discussing the fragmentation and lack of strategic focus in current federal counterterrorism programs. Based on many of the studies and audits conducted for this subcommittee, GAO recommends greater use of Results Act principles to measure progress towards a truly national strategy. And without objection, so ordered. And I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose. And without objection, so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection, so ordered. And at this time, I would um, uh, welcome our uh, primary uh, witness, uh, the Honorable Warren B. Rudman, who is co-chair, uh, and Charles G. Boyd, general, uh, executive director. And Mr. Rudman is co-chair of the U.S. Commission on National Security, 21st Century. And as you know, Mr. Rudman, we swear in all our witnesses, and I would welcome both our witnesses to stand. Please, Mr. Boyd, as well. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, no, for the record, both our witnesses uh, respond in the affirmative. And uh, Senator Rudman, um, what we do is we do the five minute, but we turn it over uh, because we do want you to make your statement and we do want a part of the record. And, uh, and then we'll uh, uh, ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't think I have more than five minutes, and I expect General Boyd has a few minutes, and uh, we're here for as long as you need us. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm honored to be here today on behalf of the United States Commission on National Security, 21st Century. Uh, I co-chaired this with former Senator Gary Hart. Senator Hart is in London and unable to be here, and I'm delighted that General Boyd is able uh, to accompany me. For those of you that are not familiar with the background of the membership of this commission, it was very unique. It was the brainchild of former Speaker Newt Gingrich, who looked at the fragmentation that was called to his attention uh, in this area of terrorism against our homeland, approached President Clinton, and together uh, they put together legislation which created this commission. It, it was then turned over for administrative purposes to the Department of Defense. The funding came out of the Department of Defense. Uh, we've been at this for more than two years. This has not been a staff-run activity. Uh, this has been a, an activity run very much by the commissioners themselves, who spent a great deal of time over this period of two years, including a number of weekends at various retreats, uh, going over and fighting out these issues. And when you read the report, you'll find that it's not like many reports, which tries to recommend that which is possible. This report recommends what we think you ought to do. Now, politically, that's your problem, not ours. But we didn't think we ought to give you, you know, our political judgment. We thought we ought to give you our best judgment, and we've given you a roadmap for how to do these things. For those of you unfamiliar with the commission, let me tell you uh, alphabetically who served, and it was totally bipartisan. 
Ann Armstrong, a former chairman of the PIFIAB and also former ambassador to the Court of St. James. John Dancy, some of you know, international correspondent for many years for NBC News. Les Gelb, president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Lee Hamilton, familiar to all of you here in the House. Donald Rice, a former Secretary of the Air Force, former head of RAND Corporation. Harry Train, former Commander-in-Chief Atlantic, four-star admiral. Norm Augustine, well known for, to many of you for his work uh, in government, but of course best known probably as being chairman of, chairman of Lockheed Martin. Jack Galvin, former head of NATO. Newt Gingrich, Lionel Ulmer, Under Secretary of Commerce at one time in the Reagan Administration for International Trade. Jim Schlesinger, who held, I believe, four or five cabinet posts in various administrations, and Andrew Young, a former uh, commissioner, a former ambassador to the United Nations and former mayor of Atlanta. I want to get directly uh, to the question that your letter of invitation posed to us, and you asked, uh, why is there no comprehensive national strategy to combat terrorism? I would start my answer by pointing out that dealing with terrorism is an enormously complex problem. As we all understand, terrorism is varying and varyingly motivated. Sometimes it emanates from states, sometimes from groups, or even from individuals. Uh, sometimes it comes from combinations of state sponsorship and non-state actors, or either one. The source of these groups are wide, coming from no one region of the world. And as we have had the misfortune to learn, it can include domestic elements as well. Terrorism also takes several tactical forms, assassinations, bombing, biological or chemical attack, cyber terror, and potentially terrorism perpetrated by the use of weapons of mass destruction. Terrorists may also choose a wide array of targets, a complexity that has generated considerable confusion. While some scholars define terrorism in its basic form as essentially unconventional attacks on civilians for any of several purposes. Others include attacks on uniformed military personnel operating abroad as forms of terrorism, such as Covart Towers, such as the USS Cole incident. Others disagree. They consider such attacks to be another method of waging conventional warfare. The distinction is not just definitional or theoretical. Unfortunately, it influences how the U.S. government approaches policy solutions to these problems. Clearly, given this diversity of motives, sources, tactics, and definitions, the responsibility for dealing with terrorism within the United States government ranges over a wide array of executive branch departments and agencies, as well as several Senate and House committees on the legislative branch side. Developing any effective, comprehensive strategy for dealing with terrorism would be difficult in any event, but under these circumstances, even more so. And I must say, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm a great believer in graphics. Now, whether these have just been placed here for future witnesses or whether they're here to illustrate the problem, there it is in front of you. You could not have a more clear, definitive definition of what we're talking about than looking at the names all of them, great organizations, well-motivated, trying to do the right thing. But look at the number of them. Whoever on your staff came up with that idea deserves an oak leaf cluster. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you make an assumption, sir, that it was staff that thought of the idea? <laughs> well, maybe that's because I served in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> The U.S. Commission on National Security 21st Century concluded that however difficult the problem of terrorism may be, we simply must do a better job of dealing with it. There is no national security problem of greater urgency. The Commission Phase One report on the national security environment of the next 25 years concluded unequivocally, based on unbelievably lengthy, complex, and detailed testimony from many in this government concluded that the prospect of mass casualty terrorism on American soil is growing sharply. We believe that over the next quarter of a century, the danger will not only be one of the most challenging we face, but the one we are least prepared to address. The Commission's Phase Two report on strategy focused directly on this challenge, arguing that the United States needed to integrate the challenge of homeland security fully within its national security strategy. The Commission's 
Phase 3 report released on January 31st and delivered to the President on that date devotes an entire first section, one of five, to the problem of organizing the United States government to deal effectively with homeland security. We have argued that to integrate this issue properly into an overall strategic framework, there must be a significant reform of the structures and processes of the current national security apparatus. As you know, Mr. Chairman, the Phase 3 report recommends the creation of a national homeland security agency. But before I discuss this proposal, I wish to stress what the Commission intends and does not intend to achieve with its recommendations, because some of it, I believe, has been misunderstood probably by people who didn't read it very carefully, but it has nevertheless been misunderstood. The United States needs to inculcate strategic thinking and behavior throughout the entire national security structure of government. In the Commission's view, and notwithstanding the early exertions of the new administration, we have a long way to go in this regard. We have not had in recent years a process of integrated strategy formulation, a top-down approach led by the President and the senior members of his national security team where priorities were determined and maintained and where resources were systematically matched to priorities. There has been almost no effort to undertake functional budgeting analysis for problems that spread over the responsibilities of many executive branch departments and agencies. The result being that it's extremely difficult for the Congress in its oversight role to have a sense of what any administration is doing with respect to major national security objectives. Finally, there has been systematic effort, there has been no systematic effort from the NSC level to direct the priorities of the intelligence community to align them with the priorities of national strategy. And I might say to you, in a, another hat that I've worn for the last eight years as chairman and vice chairman of the PIFIAB, I can tell you that that statement is absolutely sound and something that, that needs to be addressed. It needs to be clear before we discuss the proposal for a National Homeland Security Agency. We conceive of the National Homeland Security Agency as a part of, not a substitute for, a strategic approach to the problem of homeland security. Clearly, even with the creation of that agency, the National Security Council will have a critical role in coordinating the various government departments and agencies involved in homeland security. The Commission's proposed strategy for homeland security is threefold, to prevent, to protect, and to respond to the problem of terrorism and other threats to the United States. The Department of State has a critical role in prevention, as does the intelligence community and others. The Department of Defense has a critical role in protection, as do other departments and agencies. Many agencies of government, including, for example, the Center for Disease Control and the Department of HHS, has a critical role in response. Clearly, we are not proposing to include sections of the intelligence community, the State Department, the Defense Department, and the Department of Health and Human Services in this new agency. As with any other complex functional area of government responsibility, no single agency will ever be adequate to the task. That said, the United States stands in need of a stronger organizational mechanism for homeland security. It needs to clarify accountability, responsibility, and authority among the departments and agencies with a role to play in this increasingly critical area. It needs to realign the diffused responsibilities that sprawl across outdated concepts of boundaries. It also needs to recapitalize several critical components of U.S. government. We need a cabinet-level agency for this purpose. The job has become too big, requires too much operational activity to be housed at the NSC level. It is too important to a properly integrated national strategy, strategy to be handed off to a czar, we seem to have czaritis in this government for the last 10 years. It didn't work in Russia, and I don't think it's worked very well here. Uh, it requires an organizational focus of sufficient heft to deal with the departments of state, defense, and justice in an efficient and an effective way. Mr. Chairman, the Commission's proposal for National Homeland Security Agency is detailed with great care and precision in the Phase Three report. With your kind permission, I would like to include that section of the report in the record here, for I see no need to repeat here word for word what the report has already said and is available to all. Without objection, we'll be happy to do that. So I will give that to your stenographer. However, I would like to describe the proposal's essence for the subcommittee. I will not mince words. We propose a cabinet-level agency for Homeland Security whose civilian director will be a statutory advisor to the National Security Council. 
the same status as that of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency or the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The director will be appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The basis of this agency will be the present Federal Emergency Management Agency. Added to FEMA will be the Coast Guard from the Department of Transportation, the Border Patrol from the Department of Justice under INS, the Customs Service, the Law Enforcement part of Customs Service from the Department of Treasury, the National Domestic Preparedness Office, that's the NDPO, currently housed at the FBI, and an array of cybersecurity programs now housed varyingly in the FBI, the Commerce Department, and elsewhere. Together, the National Homeland Security Agency will have three directorates, prevention, critical infrastructure, protection, and emergency preparedness and response, and a National Crisis Action Center to focus federal action in the event of a national emergency response, and a National Crisis Action Center to focus federal action in the event of a national emergency. The agency will build on FEMA's regional organizational and will not be heavily focused in D.C. It will remain focused on augmenting and aiding state and local resources. The purpose of this realignment of assets is to get more than the sum of the parts from our effort in this area. Right now, unfortunately, we are getting much less than the sum of the parts. We are not proposing vast new undertakings. We are not proposing a highly centralized bureaucratic behemoth. We are not proposing to spend vastly more money than we are spending now. We are proposing a realignment and a rationalization of what we already do so we can do it right. In this regard, we intend for the union of FEMA, Coast Guard, Border Patrol, Customs, and other organizational elements to produce a new institutional culture, new synergies, and a higher morale. We are proposing to match authority, responsibility, and accountability. We are proposing to solve the who's in charge problem. Perhaps the most important of all, we are proposing to do all this in such a way as to guarantee the civil liberties that we all hold so dear, since it is very likely that Defense Department assets would have to come into play in response to a mass casualty attack on U.S. soil. The best way to ensure that we violate the U.S. Constitution is to not plan and train ahead for such contingencies. The director of the National Homeland Security Agency, I repeat, is a civilian. If no such person is designated, responsible ahead of time to plan, train, and coordinate for the sort of national emergency of which we are speaking, I leave it to your imagination and to your mastery of American history to predict what a condition of national panic might be produced in this regard. Mr. Chairman, one final point, if I may. All 14 of us on this commission are united in our belief that this proposal is the best way for the United States government to see this as a common defense. All 14 of us, without dissent, agreed to put this subject first and foremost in our final report. All 14 of us, seven Democrats and seven Republicans, are determined to do what we can to promote this recommendation on a fully bipartisan basis. But we are not naive. We know that we're asking for big changes. I know as a former member of the legislative branch that what we are proposing requires complex and difficult congressional action. This proposal stretches over the jurisdictions of at least seven committees, plus their Appropriation Committee's counterparts of the House and the Senate. This is why, Mr. Chairman, the work of this committee and the Committee on Government Reform is so critical to the eventual success of this effort. And that's why I again want to express my gratitude for the opportunity to be here today. Finally, Mr. Chairman, before General Boyd testifies, I just want to tell you a little bit about General Boyd, which would not be known. Uh, General Boyd uh, was asked by Speaker Gingrich at the time, who he knew personally, to head up this effort. Uh, General Boyd uh, spent six and a half years uh, in, a, in a Hanoi prison. He is the only POW who reached four-star rank and following that held enormously responsible positions throughout our government until his retirement. We were very fortunate to have General Boyd lead our effort. I always told him I thought it was a little bit beneath his pay grade, but he was willing to take this on as executive director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. It may have been beneath his pay grade, but I think he realizes the important work of the commission and uh, therefore was happy to serve. And uh, it's uh, wonderful, Senator, to have you here. You're such a distinguished witness, and the commission has done such an outstanding job. And obviously, General uh, 
it's a, a tremendous honor to have you testify before the committee for your service to our country. I'm just going to acknowledge the uh, presence of Mr. Gilman, Ben Gilman, who was the former chairman of the International Relations Committee, and we'll be calling on him shortly. But Mr. Boyd, happy to have you uh, make your statement. General, if you have any. There's not much I can add uh, to that statement. Uh, is that because you wrote it, or is that because? <laughs> that is his statement, sir. That is his statement. I might add one piece of evidence uh, or emphasis or uh, amplification. I believe at, at the outset of this enterprise, if, if, if you'd have queried the 14 commissioners and asked them if uh, they were going to end up at the end uh, making their most important recommendation, their highest priority recommendation, uh, the formi uh, forming of a national security uh, homeland, uh, homeland security agency, I think they would have they would have scoffed at the idea. But as time went on and I watched their thinking develop and they watched and, and, and saw the evidence from the intelligence community, as they traveled about and they traveled uh, throughout the world uh, to over two dozen countries, uh, there was a gradual um, coming together of their thinking um, along the lines uh, as follows. One, that the resentment uh, focused toward the United States throughout much of the world, I think, came as a surprise, as a symbol of the globalizing um, vectors that we are on and the exclusion of so many people and nations from that process, and the emphasis of the United States being the symbol of that uh, vector, um, has produced uh, a degree of resentment that, as I say, I think came as a surprise to many. It was crystallized one night and we were in Egypt and uh, talking with a, a group of scholars. And one of them, a distinguished gentleman, looked at us and said, the problem for you over the next quarter of a century is managing resentment in, throughout the world against your country. Um, at some level, I think that was a message we got everywhere. When we coupled that with all of the intelligence that we had access to and saw that the proliferation of, of these capabilities, these weapons of mass destruction, uh, weapons of mass disruption, um, into the hands of state and non-state actors who never before in history had had that kind of power that they could wield against a great state, and coupled with what they might consider reason to be resentful of us, we had the formula for um, a security problem that, as the senator said, it appeared we just weren't addressing in any uh, sophisticated or complete way. And I think that's what drove these commissioners to the set of conclusions that they reached at the end. And stacking this as the most important, the highest priority, national security objective um, that our nation should follow. Thank you very much, General. It's a, a, candidly a very stunning um, recommendation and one that I was surprised by, but uh, given the work that our committee has done, we, I think, can fully understand why it was made. And I would make the point to you that Mac Thornberry has introduced uh, legislation that incorporates your recommendations it was sent to this committee and it will, uh, excuse me, sent to the full committee, I think probably sent to this committee, but not sure. Uh, but at any rate, it, uh, I believe it will be seriously considered uh, uh, by, by the committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe that Congressman Skelton also is introducing or has introduced uh, or about to a major piece of legislation, mm -hmm. not precisely uh, like Congressman uh, Thornberry's, but but dealing with this issue based on our report. That's great to know, and uh, we'll be following that as well. At this time, I would uh, call on uh, 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 Adam Putnam, uh, the vice chairman of the committee, to start the questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the panel for their very intriguing and, and uh, unnerving testimony. But certainly, uh, you fulfilled your, your role in, in thinking outside the box and bringing us a very innovative approach. You, you make um, great reference to, to managing this resentment. How much of, of this resentment is of our own doing that could be addressed through 
consistent policy or redirection of policies, and how much of it is, as you alluded to, an overall vexing discomfort that we see even in our own country over the uncontrollable forces of globalization? Well, I'll, I'll answer it briefly and let <coughs> General Boyd comment. There are some things that will change only if and when American foreign policy changes in some areas, and I'm not suggesting it should be changed. I'm just trying to answer your question. Uh, certainly in the Middle East, uh, it is our foreign policy in the Middle East that drives this resentment. Uh, and I've had that kind of up, some up close and personal experience with that recently, and uh, there was no question that uh, there was deep resentment and, uh, and uh, the Osama bin Laden uh, activities are driven by our policy. Uh, I have always thought our policy was the correct policy, but obviously people over there don't. In other parts of the world, it is not so much our policy as our projected strength. Uh, you know, uh, uh, nobody likes uh, the big guy. Uh, and uh, sometimes we haven't been over the years uh, too circumspect in how we dealt with our bigness. Uh, so there's that kind of resentment. And that, of course, plays right into what your last part of your question, Congressman Putnam, and that was the fact that undoubtedly globalization tends to put all of this under a magnifying glass. And you put it all together and you, and you find this resentment at, at an extraordinary level, which I think surprised even some of us who had, had major foreign travel, had served on major committees that dealt with these issues, but the resentment was substantial. Chuck, do you want to add to that at all? Um, just this, that <clears throat> if you develop Can a strategy... You just to move the mic a little, you just yes, slide yes, sir. over a little bit. Yes, sir. Thanks. If you, if you develop a strategy, a national security strategy for dealing with this problem, it seems to me that the front end, along the lines that we have suggested, uh, the framework of which would be a protection, a, a prevention, protection, and response. Um, the prevention piece uh, deals at, uh, at the heart of this problem. Uh, the diplomatic uh, core would be at the forefront of dealing with uh, of, of this uh, problem over the, um, uh, the rest of the planet. I think that the, the kind of uh, uh, self-absorption that we often project or, or uh, maybe even arrogance uh, is all a part of that. And that can be worked in, 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 a, in a solid approach to um, a diplomatic approach to, to, to this problem. But in the end, uh, as the senator says, we're going to be uh, we're going to be the symbol of power and wealth and and uh, influence, and there's going to be resentment uh, no matter how effective our uh, uh, diplomatic approach is. So this is something we just simply have to deal with, have to live with, and prepare for. It seems to me. Has our hierarchy of threats that all of these establishments have identified? Has it evolved to match this changed philosophy, this newfound globalized resentment that has developed at the close of the Cold War? Are we prepared for the proper threats both at home and abroad? Well, I think the answer clearly no. Uh, let me give you an anecdote of something that got all of our attention. Uh, about uh, six months ago. I, I really uh, commend to you an article in Foreign Relations magazine by a young Coast Guard commander who's doing a fellowship up there in New York who decided to look at the threat of weapons of mass destruction to the United States. And, I mean, it's stunning. And let me just give you in a paragraph what essentially the findings were. There were 55,000 containers that come off ships in the United States every day. 55,000. A small fraction of them are opened at the port. Most of them go to their destination, be it St. Louis, uh, Chicago, Dallas, uh, Boston, whatever, on the west coast uh, into the southwest or along the west coast. Some of them aren't open for a matter of months, I believe. Am I correct, Chuck? Could be a month or two. A month yes. or two. Now, it doesn't take much imagination that with the technology available to so many people who ought not to have it, that the acquisition of a small amount of fissionable material 
put in the right kind of a design and placed in one of those uh, carriers. I mean, the thought is horrendous, but it's real. It also goes to biological and chemical. So although I am not here to comment on the proposal that is being debated about missile shield defense, if I wanted to set off a weapon of mass destruction in New York, I think I probably wouldn't do it with something that had a return address on it. <laughs> we had testimony from the intelligence community and from people looking at this problem, and we need more intelligence, but most of all, we not only need more prevention, but we have to understand how to respond. You may remember that former Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen about a year and a half ago, I believe it was before you came to Congress, Mr. Putnam, but it's worth getting a look at in response to your question. Secretary Cohen wrote an article that essentially said it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. I'm sure the members of Congress here remember reading that. It was a very stunning article, appeared in the Washington Post op-ed page, in which the Secretary of Defense said, we are going to have a horrible incident in this country over the next 10, 15 years. Sooner or later, we don't know. It's going to happen. And we're not prepared to deal with it. And, you know, I was thinking as we were developing this report of the horrible events of Oklahoma City. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that was a horrible event. That was infinitesimal compared to what we're talking about. And it has to be addressed. It is a moral responsibility for this Congress to address this issue. You don't have to come up with our solution, but you have to come up with a solution. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kucinich, and then we'll go to Mr. Gumman. Senator, and uh, uh, again, welcome. Thank you. Uh, in your testimony, you said, perhaps most important, we are proposing to do all this in such a way as to guarantee the civil liberties we all hold dear. I had a chance to review the uh, Phase Three report, and I, I may have missed uh, the section, or maybe it wasn't included, but I didn't see any comprehensive statement in here of how civil liberties would be guaranteed uh, in such a framework. On page 11, top paragraph, let me read to you that paragraph so you don't have to all look it up. Congress is crucial as well for guaranteeing that homeland security is achieved within a framework of law that protects the civil liberties and privacy of American citizens. We are confident that the government can enhance national security without compromising constitutional principles. In order to guarantee this, we must plan ahead. And a major attack right. involving... Senator, Senator, with all due respect, yeah. I, I, I did see oh, that. Oh, all right, fine. W with all due respect, I, I did see What that. is your question? Uh, How I'll do we go, do I'll it? Go over it? I'll go over it again. All right. Uh, you said that we're proposing to do this in such a way as to guarantee the civil liberties. Correct. How do you establish a, a national security apparatus in the United States in effect implement a national security state and simultaneously protect civil liberties. I'd be, I think we'd all be interested to I'd know be happy to answer the question. how you would do that. See, uh, Congressman, that's a great question. The problem we were all concerned with was without this kind of planning, if something happens in Cleveland, it's going to be the military that's going to be there instantly, and you may have to even declare martial law if there are enough casualties and enough destruction. You've not planned for it. You don't, have, uh, you don't have interfaces between federal and state government and city government, which are already planned and in place with civilians in charge. That's what will happen today. That's what happens in the event of massive tornadoes or massive hurricanes along the southeast coast back about 10, 12 years ago and more recently. What we say is if you have a civilian in charge of this agency, and your planning and training and prevention is involved with setting up scenario planning with city and state governments across this country, then if something does happen, you are in a position to have civilian control with the military assisting them. Now, the military has so-called posse comitatus restrictions, as well it should. But in times of martial law, you know, those essentially aren't observed. So you're envisioning martial law? I'm envisioning that there would be martial law unless you had this agency in place. That's what we're saying, absolutely. 
So a governor doesn't have the ability to, uh, uh, in effect, declare an emergency? A mayor doesn't have that ability to declare an emergency? Abs they certainly do, but they, don't have the de they do not have the, the, the authority to declare martial law on a national basis, I can assure you that. Local police departments don't have the ability to enforce uh, law in, within a community? Congressman, as good as local police forces are, and I'm a former state attorney general and I have a high regard for them, they could not possibly cope with the kind of thing we're talking about. They don't have enough resources, enough people, and by the way, they may be the victims themselves. And, and in, when we speak of homeland security, we're implying that we're not protected right now. We are not. $300 billion a year the American taxpayers pay for a Department of Defense, and billions more for state patrol and billions more for protection from, uh, of their local police departments. And you're saying that despite spending billions and billions and billions of dollars, uh, we're still not protected. And so I would ask you, Senator, uh, just as uh, coming from Cleveland, Ohio, as you so kindly recognize, how could I convince my constituents that in a, an environment where hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent, and that's not enough, that they should spend more, particularly when their schools are uh, not up to par, when people don't have decent health care, when they have roads and bridges falling apart. Uh, please enlighten me, Senator. Sure, be happy to. Number one, we're not saying you have to spend more. These agencies spend quite a bit of money now themselves, but we think that we're not getting the right bang for the buck. Number two, with all due respect to your comments about national security, Almost all of our expenditures for national security, up to now at least, are for conventional warfare in a two major theater war scenario, which I expect will soon be done with, but that is the current planning. All the aircraft carriers, all the Army and Marine divisions, the entire Air Force, none of that is directed towards homeland security. The only thing that we know is that if something bad happens today, the only organization in the United States, the only organization, in the event of a weapon of mass destruction going off or being put on the water supply or whatnot, the only people who could respond would be U.S. military. There is no one else. They have the transportation, the communication, the medical supply. They have it all. Unfortunately, it has not been coordinated in the way that it has to be, and we believe this agency in its prevention and response missions would do just that. Uh, I'd like to go back to something, Senator, and that is how do we guarantee civil liberties in a national security state? I mean, we're, we're really talking about a profound change in the way we view ourselves as a nation. We're talking about a fortress America here. How do we guarantee people's basic constitutional rights to privacy, to being able to freely associate with who they want, to be able to freely speak, uh, in the way that they want. How do we guarantee that within the framework of a bill that, uh, that frankly, it's, um, uh, its linguistic construction raises some chilling possibilities of something that's anti-democratic? Yeah, we debated that, and we don't think it does. Uh, we had people on our commission, such as uh, former NBC correspondent Bud Dancy that was very concerned about that very issue, and we don't think our recommendation amounts to at all. As a matter of fact, Congressman, I could almost guarantee you that the people of Cleveland, Ohio, wouldn't even know this agency existed except for those people who were in police, fire, medical, who would be getting training from this agency and recommendations. No one would even know it existed because it has no interface with the community until something happens. Now, when something happens, I would say to you quite frankly that if it was bad enough, I suppose there, there could be some period of time where the governor, the mayor, or the president uh, might decide that they would have to suspend things. For instance, if a nuclear weapon went off uh, in a major American city. Uh, but we're not talking about uh, any deprivation of civil liberty in normal circumstances. In almost all circumstances, including hurricanes and floods in this country, including in your own state, there have been occasions where the National Guard had to be called out to keep order and to spend, suspend certain liberties until the situation could be simmered down to protect law-abiding citizens. And that is 
not part of our recommendation. That's just what happens. I, I think, uh, Senator, it would be enlightening for this committee to be able to have some kind of proceedings of those debates that took place within your commission over the issues and concerns about civil liberties. Would be happy I mean, to I'd be happy to take the senator's word for it, but we could also perhaps learn on this committee about some of the concerns that were expressed, because I think that an appropriate form would be this committee and uh, the Congress to have a, a wide and open discussion in which, with which perhaps our constituents could be involved in uh, what the implications would be for the democracy of having such a, um, a structure in place, particularly since it would be, by your statement, invisible. Oh, I would hope it would be, as FEMA is invisible to most of the residents of all of our states until something bad happens. And when something bad happens, they suddenly realize that something called FEMA they never heard about. And I must say, I think that under former Director Witt, they did a first-rate job. I think you would concur, though, that the, that the broad scope of this, uh, of this homeland, the Homeland Security Act, goes far beyond anything that encompasses the purpose of FEMA. Oh, absolutely. It expands it. Uh, it gives uh, coordination to it. It, it. it is heavy on prevention. It is heavy on intelligence gathering, uh, abroad, obviously, and to some extent domestically by the FBI. But all of the people that do what they're supposed to do would continue to do the same thing. But there would be a lot more coordination and planning. Right now, there have been a number of exercises around the country uh, conducted by various organizations directing it towards a mass destruction weapon being imposed on a state or a city, but hardly enough. Senator, thank you. Uh, did we, you will, we will get to you, Congressman. Uh, well, what, do you summary, mean by, what do you mean by that? We will get... <laughs> we, we, <laughs> you're so well, if you'd like to put an exclamation point at the first six words, <laughs> that's your privilege. We will, we will get to you, Congressman, a, a, uh, a position paper that will summarize the debate and how we concluded what we concluded on the very issue of civil liberties that you are rightfully concerned about. I, I appreciate that, Senator, and I, I certainly, and I also appreciate your service to this country as well as General Boyd's. Uh, General Boyd uh, stated several times uh, about this uh, concept of managing resentment. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that, General? I guess we're out of time right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gilman, it's a privilege to have you here, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome Senator Rudman and General Boyd. Um, I commend you, too, Mr. Chairman, for focusing attention on this very critical problem. And I want to commend uh, Senator Rudman and General Boyd for the report that they've issued, uh, focusing the country's attention on what has to be done. Apparently, there is no central entity at the moment. And the fragmentation is uh, abundant throughout the, the government. And nobody is truly prepared of, uh, to uh, take the preparations for avoiding uh, terrorism in the first place and then how to properly address it. Uh, in our International Relations Committee, we focused a great deal of attention on our uh, usual targets, our embassies abroad. And, uh, you know, uh, I was present when Admiral Inman came before us many years ago. You were there, Senator Redman. I served on that commission. Uh, and there you are. Chairman yeah, and he tried to focus attention on what we should be doing, and we reacted very uh, belatedly and still have yet to prepare the proper security of those posts abroad. Then uh, Admiral Crow, Ambassador Crow, came forward reiterating it. Uh, last year, we tried to put some real money in uh, to the budget to try to move back the, uh, 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 the, the embassy posts abroad, move them back from streets, move them back from uh, danger areas. Uh, they say that every 10 feet means another floor you can say, say, sir, save in the long run. And yet we've been very reluctant to do these kind of things. So I hope that your commission uh, will continue to remind our nation of what we should be doing to uh, protect those a agencies that we have abroad, and particularly our embassies, which are a, a target that have often been uh, addressed. Uh, I note that uh, in your report you talk in part of prevention, 
that is, as well as prosecution, that we need better intelli human intelligence. And that seems to have been a big problem over the years. Uh, CIA had a restriction on who they recruit for these kind of uh, activities. And I hope that that will be changed uh, in the future so that we can have proper intelligence. That's three quarters of the battle. If we have some advanced information about what's happening in these terrorist organizations. And we have to find a way to uh, breach those organizations to become involved with them. And then, too, uh, you talk about the better coordination. And uh, we have no coordination at the moment. It's uh, a band-aid approach, a reaction approach, as we've had in so many other disasters. Uh, and I think that having your home security agency is a sound method of bringing people together. Uh, let me ask you, what has been the uh, attitude of the administration, the present administration, with regard to your proposal? Well, you know, they're in their first 100 days, and they've got a lot of things uh, to do. Uh, we have had, uh, of course, there are, there are uh, five or six major chapters of this report with recommendations for DOD. We've had a major meeting with Secretary Rumsfeld, has, who, who's asked us on that aspect of it to, to work with them, uh, and they like a number of our recommendations. For your personal interest, we had an excellent meeting with uh, Secretary Powell, uh, and as a matter of fact, we were asked by the House Budget Committee to testify following General Powell uh, two weeks ago on the State Department, which uh, I think you would find that part of our report, uh, knowing some of your public statements, I think you'd agree with virtually all of it. General Powell likes a good deal in that report, and they're moving towards it. Um, as far as the President and the National Security Council, it's kind of interesting that our recommendation on the NSC, uh, and I'm sure it's not because we said it, but coincidentally, they have embodied our recommendation to make mm -hmm. the NSC more of a coordinator and certainly not operational or a, a second State Department uh, within the White House, which has been, I know, a concern of many people for a long time. So I would say the administration's responded well. Uh, we haven't got a specific response to this, but I know they're looking at it. Is there specific legislation that you've proposed for the National Homeland Security Agency? We have 50 recommendations, and from those recommendations, we thought the Congress ought to draft the legislation. We thought it would be presumptuous of us to draw a bill as a presidential commission. Uh, and has anyone undertaken that, Senator? Uh, to uh, incorporate Mac, Mac uh, Thornberry uh, and Ike uh, Skelton. Uh, Thornberry's bill tracks our recommendations very closely uh, on homeland security, and Mr. Skelton also embodies much of it, but it's a bit different. As a, as as I said before, you arrived here, Chairman Gilman. We are not saying that this is the only way to do it, but we're saying here is the problem. There's got to be a way. Here's our suggestion. Uh, let the Congress work its will and do something to improve the current situation. Uh, 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 Congressman Kucinich was, was talking about money, very important subject. We are not talking about particularly expanding money, but when you look at these signs up here for the future speakers uh, from all the departments they come from, I don't know if they're on both sides. I don't know whether you can see them from your side or not but there are about 40 or 42 of them up there. They spend a huge amount of money right now. We say it can be spent a lot better. Let me ask you, uh, uh, what's the response by the intelligence agency? Oh, Have you discussed this with Mr. Tennant? Oh, absolutely, because I've had an ongoing relationship because I still chair the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. They are very aware, as is the FBI. I might say, and I can't get into detail of this kind of a session, but. I think that the intelligence community and the FBI has been doing a first-rate job on prevention. Not enough, not good enough. Very hard to, to figure out what some guy in a tent in Afghanistan is thinking about doing to somebody who's living in New York uh, unless you really have human intelligence, uh, terrific signals intelligence, and all of these things. But I must say that it is a high priority of both the agency and the Bureau. I'm pleased the uh, Federal Bureau is now planning to create a, a tri police academy training unit in UAE, just as they've done successfully in Budapest and South Africa. I think these can be extremely helpful.
Uh, our liaison relationships with these countries is probably the most valuable thing that we have in terms of understanding terrorism that has its origins overseas. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Redman and General Boyd, for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Senator Rudman and General Boyd, um, how did the uh, Commission deal with the question of preparing uh, for so-called low uh, probability, high consequence threats uh, like um, mass uh, casualties for biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons? Under uh, our proposal in the, in the response section of that, uh, we uh, believe that the model should be what has already been done in exercises carried out by DOD uh, with local guard units and local cities and counties and states in which you have scenario planning based on if this were to happen, which you refer to as low probability but high damage, high impact events, that the medical services, the police services, the municipal services, the office of the mayor, the governor, that they are, everybody understands what, what you try to do, knowing that communications will be disrupted, key people will be disabled, but you put together a plan. And that is one of the major roles in the response side of the new agency. However, in order to be able to do that, you need the prevention and the training. And you'd have to do it across a broad spectrum of these agencies, which is unfortunately done, but rarely. Do you want to add to that, Chuck? Um, I think the, uh, the essence of the, the, the two things that I, I'd like to come back to, because I think they're absolutely critical. One is the, the notion of a national strategy. If this is not integrated in a national security strategy, if it's a separate entity that's dealt with independently, it, it doesn't uh, work the whole issue. And the second thing is putting somebody in charge. It's, there's, an old, there's an old saying that nothing concentrates the mind like the prospect of hanging. As a military guy, uh, a lifetime military guy, I can tell you nothing concentrates your sense of responsibility like taking command, being placed in command. Somebody who is given, who is, who is put in charge with authority, responsibility, accountability, and some capability to do his mission. And that's what we really call for, putting somebody in command at, at a sufficient level that he can deal, he or she can deal with um, other counterparts uh, in the executive branch uh, on an equal footing. I would add one thing. The, the problem with the czar approach is that you've got all of these agencies that have very powerful heads. Now you've got somebody who's supposed to direct them. Well, they have no budget authority. <laughs> And they know command authority. And that's why most of them have failed. If you do that and someone defines, then someone to define the requirements, to define the training, to, 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 to be held accountable here in Congress to come and report what they're doing, what they're not doing. Um, I think that all of these loose ends that don't now get coordinated uh, will be coordinated. With respect to, to, to the issue of civil liberties, we just go back to that for a moment. I think Congressman Thornberry's uh, uh, proposed legislation um, calls for an IG function on this uh, to deal with this issue and, and with reports back to the Congress on how we're doing with civil liberty. These are mechanisms that, that uh, almost ensure that that responsible person has to address such things as civil liberties or such things as medical preparedness. Uh, all of these things he or she will be accountable for. And, and uh, I, I think there is no other mechanism that I know of other than putting somebody in charge and held, being, holding, holding them accountable um, to ensure success. Is there any preparation at all being done at the local state level today for uh, any some? Sure. There's sure. been some, but but it's been sporadic, fragmented, but people certainly are trying, and these agencies are trying. Nothing that we say here this morning should be indicated as being critical of them. We are not. There is a there is a, a an important issue in um, an article in the most I believe the most recent issue in the National Journal entitled Beyond the Blue Canaries, 
um, which deals with and the blue canaries are the policemen. They're the first ones in a chemical environment that are, you're going to find uh, uh, that know that there's a chemical attack going on. And much the illusion is to the canaries and the mine shafts of old. Um, in that article, there is a description of the varying capabilities throughout the country, and, and it's a it's a mixed bag. There there are some communities in some states that are doing better than others with respect to uh, this kind of preparation. <coughs> we are suggesting is that with a central focus in a, in a national homeland security agency uh, of this kind with setting some standards and setting some priorities and um, a, a coherent avenue of uh, resource provision to the states and assistance uh, that that unevenness can even out uh, across the nation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. One of the challenges I think we have, Senator, um, we, you, and this committee is, what do you say that you know to be the truth without frightening the hell out of people? Um, but the fact is that we've had the Secretary of Defense say what needed to be said. It's not a matter of if there will be an attack, it's a matter of when. I really believe that. And that attack can be chemical, it can be a biological, or it could be nuclear. And um, so we know that to be the case. I, uh, or believe it to be the case. Um, in your report, I, I reacted a little differently than, than my colleague, the ranking member, and I love the synergy of, of the tough questions that were asked of you. But um, I basically read it uh, from the standpoint of uh, if we don't do something, you will end up taking away more of Americans' privileges. When um, Abraham Lincoln uh, had to basically sneak his way into D.C. because he didn't know who was friend or foe, uh, was Maryland going to be on what side? Was Virginia going to be on what side? Who was friend? Who was foe? And there were tremendous suspensions of our liberties. And that's not something we as Americans want to see happen. Um, the first question I want to, but, but they had to happen. Uh, but they happened because of the disaster. And it's interesting, if we could have prepared for it differently, would we have been able to not have seen those suspensions take place of our civil liberties? What I'd love to know to start with is, where do you draw the line of telling people what you believe to be the truth without uh, uh, over-dramatizing what you think may happen? Oh, well, that's probably the toughest question of all. Uh, and I'll answer it the best I can, because uh, I've been asked to speak about this report at various places around the country, and I have, and I have to be careful, uh, because you don't want, you know, people running out of the auditorium, Congressman Shays, uh, for the bomb shelters. Uh, essentially, I say this, that the United States government spends a great deal of money every year planning for a series of eventualities of foreign threats to our national security. Anyone who serves on the International Relations Committee or the, what we call in the Senate, the Armed Services Committee or the Intelligence Committee is well aware in detail of all of the plans that we have for a whole line of contingencies that could happen in the Middle East, in Asia, Taiwan. The military has catalogs of these, and that was one of Chuck Boyd's assignments many years ago in that planning function with the Joint Chiefs. The one thing we haven't done, I tell people, is to do the same kind of scenario planning for our own defense. And in a fairly mild way, uh, I try to tell people there are a lot of folks out there who don't like us. Uh, the people in Oklahoma City happen to be Americans, but they didn't like us or themselves, evidently. But we have what happened in New York, which could have been a terrible disaster, under, even more so than it was with the Twin Towers in New York if other types of weapons had been used. We've had other threats coming across our border, as you recall, uh, the first of the year, uh, a year ago, uh, up in the uh, North Pacific Northwest. And all of these people have a desire to inflict punishment on us as citizens. And all we're asking, I tell people, is that we put the same level of planning behind that threat as we do with a threat that might happen in Southeast Asia or in the Middle East, or who knows where. 
And I think that is probably the best way to explain to people. People understand that. And by the way, Congressman Shays, Mr. Chairman, people do understand this threat. People have thought about it. I make the assumption I want, yes, Mr. Bo General Boyd. Could, could I add just one thing, sir? One of the things that we said in relation to dealing with resentment, but I think it applies uh, really to your question, too, is tone matters. Um, the president is the one, above all others, who must articulate what the threat is to the United States with respect to the homeland. But the tone that he uses is going to be critical. You can panic the people, or you can you can be honest with them and for, forthright with them, and 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 at the same time be calm and dispassionate about uh, the nature of it, and 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 a call for taking those prudent kind of um, consolidating moves that we are calling for. This is not we don't call for huge new expenditure funds. We 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 call for a rationalization of capabilities we already have. Um, we don't create new agencies. We don't create any new big uh, bureaucracies. We simply rearrange the furniture in such a way that it has coherency and makes sense. It's you know, FEMA on steroids, as, as we say. <laughs> General I, like um, I, I want to ask both of you this question. Do you think that, um, uh, I, I want to ask it very bluntly, um, do you believe that this country will face a terrorist attack? I absolutely. Frankly, think that it would be miraculous if the next 10 years if it didn't happen. That's General Boyd, I believe that it is a very uh, high threat. Right. Yes, sir, I believe that. Now, I found myself embarrassed that I laughed at your comment uh, because I've tried to find a way to express it, uh, and that was when you were uh, talking about missile defense, which which I think we need to move forward on uh, for all the reasons that have been documented on a system that works, but I fear more the possibility of a terrorist threat from a nuclear weapon put in a, put in a, uh, uh, a shipment that's uh, in this United States. And by the way, uh, uh, they are usually opened within two months, but uh, if this is a shipment that someone is looking to protect and send to a particular place, they may find a way to have it not open for years. It's just stockpiled, ready to use when someone wants to use it and detonate, and then it could be a nuclear advice, device. But um, I found myself uh, laughing and being uncomfortable, but when you made the comment, something without a return address, that's really the reason I fear it. Well, that's it, right. Yeah. That and, is exactly right. And uh, if, if you will take the time to read this article, which is fairly short, it is a wonderful article, wonderfully researched by a brilliant young Coast Guard commander who writes about this very threat. And uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, Libya could have a ship come to the 10-mile limit and, and, and then just cruise into New York Harbor. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can happen. And that is why intelligence, as someone in the panel talked about earlier, is so vital uh, to know what's going on and to be able to trace it. But, you know, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, you know, in this business, uh, almost perfect isn't good enough. Now, uh, this gets me to this issue of why. So one reason is that it doesn't have a return address. Another is that uh, um, certain com countries may not have the capability to respond except by uh, a terrorist attack. Correct. And in the process of our doing work both at home and abroad on this issue, and it's our key concern of this committee, the terrorist threat, uh, in meeting with the general in France who's in charge of their chemical, nuclear, and biological response, he said, he said, you Americans don't seem to understand, in so many words he said this, he said that you are such a world power that the only way a force can get to you is through a terrorist attack. And he said, and he used the word resentment, he said you are resented throughout the world and this is the way they're going to get you. So now it does raise another question, maybe a little beyond what, what you've recommended, but I'd like to know your response. It does seem to suggest that that as important as our Defense Department is, uh, that our State Department uh, is extraordinarily important in maybe helping us minimize uh, the resentment and then isolating it to certain areas. And I'm interested to know, did you get into this? How do you sure manage did. the resentment? If you will uh, read uh, 
whatever chapter it is in the report on the State Department, we make that very point. I referred to it in my comments here this morning about the State Department. They, there are two things the State Department does which people don't always appreciate outside of the government. I'm sure you do here. Number one, of course, in terms of advising the President on American foreign policy and its result in a variety of ways, including resentment it may cause. But two, and equally important in my view, is that the State Department has a very important intelligence role to play. Uh, intelligence is not gathered necessarily with people wearing long raincoats and dark fedoras meeting on street corners in Budapest. It is quite often collected by ambassadors, uh, charges, other people from the mission, meeting counterparts from various countries at a lot of events who hear things, and when you put them all into a matrix, they suddenly tell a story. The State Department's INR unit has done very good work in the intelligence area. And that's one of the reasons we recommend that there be reorganization as well as more funding for the department. That would raise the question, and then I'm going to call on Mr. Kucinich, but that would raise the question that we are potentially put at a disadvantage when we don't have relations with, say, Iran. Uh, even with Iraq, frankly, uh, we don't have people there. We begin to, to lose the language. We begin to lose contacts. Um, it does make that, you know, kind of suggestion. Obviously, there's value in having people in all parts of the world. There is no question that is a judgment that presidents have to make. Uh, if you don't have people in a particular country, the amount of intelligence you gather in a variety of ways falls off very sharply. Yeah. I'm going to like to come back for a second round, but uh, Mr. Kucinich, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Red Redman, and to General Boyd. Uh, as I'm listening to this discussion here, it, it really appears that, um, that the discussion of a Homeland Security Act uh, is not only about our homeland, but it's really about America's mission in the world as well, about how we see ourselves as a nation and how we conduct our foreign policy. I, I would hope that any discussions that take place about a Homeland uh, Security Act would be within the context of, of uh, those um, essential uh, pillars of, uh, of principle. The, uh, for example, uh, I've, uh, this uh, discussion, whether we um, like it or not, is undeniably drenched in fear. Uh, is what? Undeniably drenched in fear. Uh, I remember a president who once told the American people, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I also know that we have uh, some steps, positive and constructive steps, apart from a Homeland Security Act, which could be taken to uh, lessen tensions in the world. As a matter of fact, the Congress has spent many years working on such steps long before I got here, and they include, and I know the Senator's probably been involved in many of these, a non-proliferation treaty, an anti-ballistic missile treaty, a comprehensive test ban treaty, START II, START III, and the entire panoply of arms control initiatives, which have uh, at, the, it, and at their kernel a belief that people can back away from the abyss, can learn to cooperate, and can learn to live together. Uh, at this very moment, there are proposals to build down the Russian nuclear stockpile. Russia has asked for help in getting rid of fissionable material. Russia has asked for help in uh, doing something about their nuclear scientists who are out of work. Russia has asked for help in disposing of 40,000 tons of chemical weapons, uh, all of which uh, represent a challenge for the security not only of their nation, but uh, for potential security problems abroad. Uh, we have, uh, the, the chairman pointed out in his uh, discussion, perhaps a, uh, an, an opportune moment exists to review our policies with uh, Iraq, uh, Iran. Uh, the administration recently announced uh, its uh, intention to move forward with the sale of uh, missiles to Taiwan. 
which puts us uh, in a, uh, a particularly difficult position with China. I, I think that when we uh, talk about homeland security, which encompasses a fortress America or national security state, it's helpful to broaden our vision and to say, what is our role in the world that we are creating circumstances that uh, could cause resentment? Because I think that if we do not inspect cause and effect here, we're missing out an opportunity to go beyond the analytical framework, which uh, you have spent a good deal of time uh, working on. And I think we're all grateful for you doing that, because it helps us focus on exactly where are we at at this moment with respect to uh, our condition of a nation which uh, is said to be the object of resentment in the world. I think another question that might be asked that would be appropriate is if we are so resented as a nation, as the testimony has said, and, and uh, then what are there other steps that America could take other than uh, becoming a fortress that would help to lessen the, uh, this vulnerability and this portrait of vulnerability which is being uh, drawn here? Uh, General Boyd. Well, <clears throat> uh, let me see if I can address two or three of the things in that question. First, it was not our mission. General, may I ask you a question? You are a four-star? Because they told me congressmen have four stars. What do you do when both are four stars? Yes, five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. Uh, I, I directed the question to General Boyd, though. If I have five stars, then I want General Boyd. Oh, I didn't know you directed General Boyd. You go right ahead and answer, General Boyd. I'll, I'll comment after the answer. Th Just, thank you. A couple of points, maybe. I think it might, might be useful. First of all, I think it's really important to, to recognize we've we've never suggested for a moment that we ought to develop a fortress America or a national security state. What we have suggested is that we rearrange some of the capabilities we have in a coherent way to address a problem that seems not to be well addressed. But I, I think the commission uh, goes in exactly the direction that, that, that you are suggesting with, with, with respect to the first order of dealing with this problem is to deal with it in a diplomatic way. If you'll notice in, in page 12, right at the top, under the first pillar of a, of a national security strategy, prevention, we say that uh, most broadly the first instrument is U.S. diplomacy. We go into addressing uh, grievances in the world um, uh, on the diplomatic front to begin with. Um, protecting us at home uh, is, a, is a global uh, mission. And all of the elements that you've talked about in preventing uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, arms control measures, diplomatic measures, um, conflict prevention, um, et cetera, all are elements of a strategy that would deal with homeland security at the end of the day. So I think we are in complete agreement with what you are saying, and I think it's all right here in, in our text. I want to add. We, we, yes, Senator, please, just if I may add, we're, we're in complete agreement that a structure exists currently apart from this proposal. That, I agree with you on that. Senator. Yeah, you have to understand our, our <coughs> charter uh, from the Congress. Our charter from the Congress was take a look at U.S. national security in its broadest sense in the 21st century. Don't recommend, you know, new foreign policy for us. Uh, don't tell us what weapon systems we ought to buy but give us a broad brush of some of the things that you think are wrong and how to correct them. Now, I want to just make one point, uh, Congressman, because I think it's a very important point. And you're right, I was involved in all of these things that you spoke about. The SALT treaties, the ABM treaties, the anti-perforation treaties, and many more. But those were all dealing, essentially, with the Soviet Union. We were concerned about conventional warfare. We had a policy for years, which I never liked the name of, but I guess it worked, we're all here, it was called Mutual Assured Destruction, and it went on the basis that the Soviets weren't about to launch at us, because they knew the result would be a launch at them, would all be gone, but that wouldn't be very good unless you're dealing with madmen. So all of these were directed at what we assume would be rational governments that were identifiable. 
What we're talking about are irrational governments and individuals and organizations that cannot be identified. That's where terrorism comes from, unless you can pin it to a particular country like Libya in a particular instant. So I, I agree with General Boyd's response to, to, to your comments. I agree with those. But I want to point out that all of these treaties are good in terms of preventing the American people from having inflicted upon them conventional nuclear or chemical warfare. They are not good for a wit, to use an old New Hampshire term, when it comes to dealing with the Osama bin Ladens of this world. He doesn't care about the non-proliferation treaty. If he could buy some, some Ukrainian enriched uranium and get a Russian scientist to bolt it all together, believe me, he would do it. Well, I, I also remember a, a New Hampshire term. I think it's live free or die. That's correct. And I just wonder if, uh, if in making this transition from a world of mutually assured destruction, which we've had, a whole, system, had a whole system of arms agreements to uh, back us away from that nuclear correct. abyss, that uh, we don't get to a condition where we uh, effectively chip away at uh, basic civil liberties and 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 bring up and go from mad to to, to sad self-assured assured destruction and so i mean that that again i i know senator coming from new hampshire uh, I'm, and that's it's good that you're on that committee because i know that's something you're sensitive to i'm from ohio and i'm just as sensitive to it and uh, i have a question uh which kind of fits this into a budget framework and uh perhaps senator could help me with this. And, you know, would the director of the new Homeland Security Agency have budgetary uh, authority over other agencies? In other words, could the director tell Secretary Powell or Secretary Rumsfeld to change their budget priorities? Absolutely not. Well, it, the only place where that exists now in any way is between the CIA and the Defense Department. That is more advisory than mandatory. Right. Well, that I, would not work. That's what I, I, that's what I assumed. And I, so the next question is, if, if that's the case, uh, what else remains, sir, but a uh, domestic national security apparatus? Well, that's exactly what exists. However, uh, the job of a president and a national security advisor is to coordinate these agencies, both domestic and overseas. All of these little blocks out here in this table have some piece of this. Now, obviously, we're not talking about dissolving any of these agencies, the FBI, the CIA, uh, uh, FEMA, justice, state. What we are saying is that those that have roles like justice and state will keep them, but all of these other agencies that, that only have a piece of the action will be in a central unit that will be run by a civilian director who will have to coordinate, obviously, with the CIA, the DOD, the State Department, but it'll be a far easier job of coordination because it'll be down from 45 to probably around 5. So uh, I, I know we're uh, I just want to add this, okay, Senator. I know we're going, we're moving on. Uh, again, I want to thank Senator Rudman and General Boyd for appearing today. Uh, this is an important subject, and it and it requires extensive uh, discussion and questions. And I appreciate your participation in this. And, and one final note: as somebody who served as a local official, as a councilman, and as a mayor of a city, uh, I I have a lot of confidence that perhaps there might be a way of strengthening. Um, security through using uh, local authorities. I, I think our local police uh, are well trained and they have uh, the ability to respond to crises that come up. And I think in democratic theory, the idea of, of municipal uh, police organizations uh, may in the long run uh, be able to sustain uh, any concerns about uh, threats to civil liberties. I, I want to make sure we don't, aren't, aren't in a situation where we're being told that we're gaining our liberties by uh, uh, parting with some of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I just say one, just one brief thing to sure. the Congressman. You know, your concerns are, are properly held. We have spent a lot of time on them. And one of the things we recommend is one of the things that isn't happening that will happen is the using of, of local resources but they can't be used if they're not trained and coordinated and equipped. In many cases, they don't have the funding. As a mayor, you would know for the kind of equipment they need. And let me point out that one of our recommendations has been vastly misunderstood is we talk about forward deployment of U.S. forces. 
The United States National Guard is, is forward deployed in this country. And in the event of the kind of a Holocaust we're talking about, they are the best people to aid local authorities in their states as they do now. Some of them have thought we were recommending, who didn't read the report, that that be their primary mission. We say it should be a secondary mission. Their primary mission is the one to support the regular forces in time of national emergency, particularly in times of war. Thank you, Senator. Um, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, one you. brief question of Senator Redmond, General Boyd. Um, the Conference Committee Report of 1998 in the Appropriations Act for the Departments of Commerce, Justice, and State and Judiciary Related Agency required the Department of Justice to issue a, a report, a five-year plan that was mandated at that time by the Congress, how to deal with terrorism. Congress intended the plan to serve as a baseline for the coordination of a national strategy and operational capabilities to combat terrorism. Uh, did you examine that report, Senator Redmond or General Boyd? Well, we, we looked at a lot of reports. I'm not sure that one's been published yet. Uh, that was authorized in what, 98? It was authorized in 98, and uh, in December of 98, the department issued the Attorney General's five-year plan. We've seen that, but I think there's something else that was supposed to be produced as, all, uh, as well, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that... I'm, I'm, I'm confused about that. I have seen that. It's a classified plan. I have seen that. I have seen that. And what are that your thoughts about that? It takes that? a narrow... It takes, it takes the approach you would expect them to approach, considering who they are justice it's their it's their counterintelligence plan and it's their view of coordination with local agencies i did not see that here i saw that in another hat that i wear i'm well aware of it but it does not have the breadth of the report that we have submitted it wasn't supposed to thank you very much and thank you mr chairman the um we've made reference to uh report by Sidney Freeberg, Jr., entitled Beyond the Blue Canaries. I'm going to put it on the record without objection, and I'm just going to uh, uh, read the uh, first paragraph and a half. Uh, it starts out, when you walk into clouds of poisonous gas for a living, it helps to have a sense of humor, even a morbid one. That's why fire department hazardous materials specialists often call their police colleagues blue canaries. It's a reference to the songbirds that old-time miners took the, uh, with them underground as as living or dying indicators of bad air in the shafts. The joke goes like this, quote, there's a policeman down there. He doesn't look like he's doing too well. I guess that's not a safe area, explained uh, John Eversoll, chief special functions for the Chicago department. In their oxygen masks and all enclosed plastic suits, hazmat uh, specialists such as Eversoll can approach industrial spills with confidence, and they do dozens of times a day all across the country. Fortunately, so far, they have not had to don these suits in response to some terrorist group that has doused an American city's subway or airport with lethal chemical weapons. What we did in, um, in, uh, in our district is we invited uh, a response team to come uh, to the district and act out a scenario where an Amtrak train had, had uh, uh, encountered um, uh, a derailment and uh, the police went in and they were the first responders and and they didn't come out alive uh, because of the chemicals and we had about 40 agencies some federal but we had the local police we had uh, the state police uh, we had the the national guard who were the response team and it was a fascinating experience to see how everybody would coordinate their activity and i mention that because uh, we focus primarily on the national response but we have three levels of government, and they, they could put up charts not maybe as complex as this, but, but somewhat as complex. And so I envision uh, y your recommendation is that uh, this Homeland Office would, and I don't ever see it as a fortress America, but this Homeland Office would also work what? To coordinate this and the response? Maybe you could... Uh, explains. So. Yes, it would. It, 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 one of its primary functions would be to work with, with localities, municipalities, counties, states. So if something went wrong there, there would be a plan. People would know who did what and when and where. In terms of what if the local hospital becomes disabled? What if the local police department is disabled? What if the local fire department is disabled? What if the communications network goes down? What do you do? 
and that's what we ought to be talking about. Would it also get involved? I'm looking at one of the charts that you can't see because it's closest to me, uh, but it says Department of Agriculture, and I'm just thinking, now, what would the Department of Agriculture do? And then you just have a real live example of uh, the civil liberties of farmers in Great Britain uh, who are seeing their personal property uh, destroyed uh, against their wishes in some cases because of foot and mouth disease. Now, a terrorist could simply do what, General Boyd, as it relates to that? The, the, the proliferation of disease with, with uh, biological. biological warfare in, in animals and, and, and as well as human beings. Um, I mean, there is almost every aspect of government has some piece of this where potentially it has involvement. Uh, but again, the point that you've made and the point that, that certainly we've made in our report is uh, the coordination of all of that in an effective, coherent way, uh, it just doesn't get, uh, it just doesn't get accomplished. We're going to uh, shortly get on to the next panel, but let me um, ask this question. We, we obviously uh, have a deterrence. We want to prevent and we want to protect the public from a terrorist attack. That's obviously our first interest. But obviously, we then have a response to an attack. And, um, you know, it can be uh, basically disarming a nuclear weapon. Obviously, that is something that we're prepared to do is very quickly. But, uh, but uh, take any of the three areas of mass destruction. You have communications problems. You have health problems. You have the property, the fire, the police, and so on. You, you have the hospitals. Uh, but you also want to solve the crime because we want to we want to hold people accountable for what they may have done. But it relates to this issue here. The, the, my biggest interest, obviously, is to prevent, and yours as well, and to protect. Um, in the process of your doing your research, um, uh, only the intelligence allows us to sift through hosts of vulnerabilities to distinguish the real threats. What was the Commission's view of the currency and reliability of U.S. threat assessment, uh, and how could it be better? Well, I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, as I answered, I believe, uh, before to uh, Chairman Gilman, uh, I think that there's been a vast improvement in the uh, human intelligence aspects of the work of the CIA overseas and the FBI here within this country in terms of uh, identifying threats, uh, not only against cities and citizens, but against individuals, such as the President. Uh, I Having said that, uh, it is the most difficult because unless you're 100 percent, you lose. <laughs> and uh, so I would add to your comment, Mr. Chairman, that the response be planned meticulously so every place in this country knows how it would respond. And a good place to look, if you want to, and your staff can get it for you very easily, is get all of the Japanese government's reports and all the publicly available information on the attacks of deadly gas in the Tokyo subway system by a terrorist group several years ago. We've looked at all that, as the U.S. intelligence community has all of that. It's all available. I mean, and here was a city with a fire department that's pretty well organized. Uh, dealing with a mass of people in such a small area. And look at the confusion that resulted and the problems that existed. And we're talking about a fairly minor attack in terms of the number of people affected and the number of stations that were affected. You ought to look at that. It will help answer your question about response. Thank you. Uh, but your bottom line point is that you are, you have a, a, a good amount of confidence in our capabilities. I do. Yeah. But unfortunately, I want to stress, you can't have 100 percent confidence. You'd be a fool to. And unfortunately, in this business, just one slips through. And uh, my greatest concern, incidentally, is personal opinion, not in the report, but based on a lot of work that I've done. I am more concerned about chemical and biological right now than I am about nuclear. Okay. I think it is a serious threat, easily deployed, and hard to deal with. Let me uh, conclude this uh, just asking if... Uh, uh, either of you would like to ask yourself a question that you were prepared to answer? I think you've asked them all. You've asked the best ones. Okay. Is there any comment, final comment, that either of you would like to make? My only comment would be 
that to the extent that members of the House and the Senate recognize the seriousness of this problem and recognize that if we're dealing with, you know, with missile defense and we're dealing with a lot of other issues which we should be dealing with, this should be dealt with. Yeah. This is a major threat to the American people. I'm not saying it's imminent. We have no such intelligence. But it is a major threat. Right. If you look at what happened to those wonderful young American sailors on the coal, to the Air Force men and women in Saudi, and you just amplify that a bit, you'll understand what we're talking about. Yeah. I'd like to thank both of you and also thank our, our panel to come for their patience. But uh, this has been very interesting, very helpful, and uh, uh, we look forward to continued contact with both of you. We'll cooperate with you in every way we can. And Congressman Kucinich, we will get an answer to you on the specific question you asked and how we address that issue. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, we'll call our second and last panel, Dr. Bruce Hoffman, Director, Washington Office, Rand Corporation, James, uh, General James Clapper, Vice Chairman, Advisory Panel to assess the domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction, accompanied by Michael Wormuth, Project Director, and Mr. Frank Salufo, Fo, excuse me, um, Chairman Report on Combating Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Terrorism Center for St Strategic and International Studies. Do we have anyone else that may be uh, joining us uh, as well? Uh, is that it? Is there anyone else you might, uh, any of the four of you might ask to respond? We'll ask them to stand as soon as we swear them in. <coughs> Dr. Hoffman, do you have anyone else that might respond? Okay. So if I could... Um, invite the four of you to stand and we'll swear you in. If you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. We'll note for the record all four have responded in the affirmative. And um, um, it's possible, gentlemen, I would just say that I might be out of here uh, before 12 for just a few minutes because I, I need to testify before the Appropriations Committee and they adjourn at 12. I will come back and uh, it's possible I'll still be here. We'll see. But don't take offense if I all of a sudden take off here. Um, w if you could uh, go in the order I called you, uh, we'll go first with... Well, I guess we'll just go right down the line here, okay? And Mr. Mr. Worthman, Wormuth, I'm sorry, am I saying your name correctly? My understanding is you do or don't have, you, you uh, will not have a statement but respond to questions. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Hoffman, thank you for being here. And uh, we'll, we'll take the clock five minutes. We'll roll it over and, and hope that you'd be concluded before we get to the 10. F five minutes, and then we'll roll it over. Okay. I have a staff person who is uh, kind of doing mouth. Larry, what, is, what are you trying to tell me? I just swear them in. You were too busy talking. This is, may I say something? It is, this is an enjoyment, especially on C-SPAN, to note that for the first time my director of this committee is screwed up. And uh, since I do it often, I'm delighted to know. His name is Larry Halloran. <laughs> Larry, we have sworn in everyone. And I'd like you to watch tonight to make sure you see this great moment. <laughs> it's live. Oh, it's live. Lovely. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Distinguished... We're going to have you put the mic a little closer. Okay. Uh, How's that? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and distinguished uh, members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to testify. Clearly, much has been done in recent years to ensure that America is prepared to counter the threat of terrorism. Yet, despite the many new legislative and programmatic initiatives, significant budgetary increases... You know, Dr. Hoffman, believe it or not, because you're kind of looking at me, I'm going to ask you to lower the mic a bit, and, and, and you have a, a, a fairly gentle voice, so I, okay. I want to make sure we're getting it good here. Okay. You might want to stick it on the other side, um, put the mic on the other side. Yeah. Sorry to do this to you, no, but we want to hear what you have to say. Is this better now? It's much better. Great. Thank you. Okay. Much has been done in recent years to ensure that America is prepared to counter the threat of terrorism. Yet, despite the many new legislative and programmatic initiatives, the significant budgetary increases, and the intense governmental concern that these activities evince, America's capabilities to defend against terrorism and to preempt and to respond to terrorist attacks arguably still remain in and unfocused. As last November's 
tragic attack on the USS Cole demonstrated, America remains vulnerable to terrorism overseas. Indeed, within the United States, it is by no means certain six years later that we are capable of responding to an Oklahoma City type incident. Today, however, the question is no longer one of more attention, bigger budgets, and increased personnel, but rather of greater focus, a better appreciation of the problem, a firmer understanding of the threat, and the development of a comprehensive national strategy. My testimony this morning will discuss how the absence of such a strategy has hindered counter American counterterrorism efforts by focusing on the critical importance of threat assessments in the development of a national strategy. The title of this hearing, Combating Terrorism in Search of a National Strategy, is particularly apt. Notwithstanding many of the accomplish many accomplishments that we've had in building a counterterrorism policy, it is still conspicuous that the United States lacks an overarching strategy to address this problem. And this is something that on numerous occasions, including before the subcommittee, the Gilmore Commission and its representative, its vice chairman, uh, General Clapper, has called attention to. What I would add is that the articulation and development of a comprehensive strategy is not merely an intellectual exercise. Rather, it is the foundation of any effective counterterrorism policy. Indeed, the failure to develop such a strategy has undermined and thwarted the counterterrorist efforts of many other democratic countries throughout the years, producing ephemeral, if not nugatory, effects that in some instances have proven counterproductive in the long run. Indeed, this was one of the key findings of a 1992 RAND study, which I'd like to enter the executive summary of four pages onto the record, but leave a copy of the report for the subcommittee staff to consult at their leisure. Using select historical case studies, many of United close United States allies, such as the United Kingdom, West Germany, and Italy, this was precisely the conclusion that we had reached. Accordingly, the continued absence of such a strategy threatens to negate the progress we have achieved thus far in countering the threat of terrorism. A critical prerequisite in framing such a strategy is the tasking of a comprehensive net assessment of the terrorist threat, both foreign and domestic. Indeed, this is something as well that numerous witnesses before the subcommittee from the General Accounting Office, John Parachini from the Monterey Institute have previously called attention to. They have cited that there's been no net assessment for at least the past six years, and also that no means exist to conduct such an assessment of the terrorist threat within the United States itself. Equally as problematic, it is now nearly a decade since the last NIE, National Intelligence Estimate on Terrorism, a prospective forward-looking effort to predict and anticipate future trends in terrorism, was undertaken by the intelligence community. Admittedly, a new NIE on terrorism is currently being prepared as part of a larger process of viewing all threats against the United States. But one has to ask, given the profound changes we have seen in the character, nature, identity, and motivations of the perpetrators of terrorism within the past 10 years, one would argue that such an estimate is long overdue. Certainly, the Global Trends 2015 effort undertaken by the National Intelligence Council last year was a positive step forward in this direction. However, at the same time, at least in the published, unclassified version of that report, little attention was paid to terrorism. The danger of not undertaking such assessments and constantly revisiting previous assessments is that we risk remaining locked in a mindset that has become antiquated, if not anar anachronistic. Indeed, right now, we're very much view terrorism through a prison locked in the 1995-96 mindset when some of the key or pivotal terrorist incidents of that particular period, some that were discussed by uh, Senator Rudman and General Boyd this morning, the 1995 attack on the Tokyo subway and the bombing a month later of the Oklahoma City bombing, have framed our perceptions and understanding of the terrorist problem. Now, those perceptions and that understanding may still be accurate, may still be correct, but without constantly going back and asking and applying them to current developments in terrorism, we don't know that. Let me give you one example. At the time, and in my written testimony, I refer to several statements made by directors of the Central Intelligence that said in the mid-1990s we faced a worsening terrorist problem. The number of terrorist incidents was increasing, terrorism was becoming more lethal, and therefore this argument was used to present a framework that terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction had not just become possible, probable, or even likely, but that it was inevitable 
imminent and even certain. This may well be the case, but at the same time, though, by not taking advantage of the longer unfolding of trends, we may miss the point. For example, lethality in terrorism, in fact, at least as targeted against Americans, declined rather than increased throughout the 1990s. For example, overseas, six times as many Americans were killed by terrorists in the 1980s as in the 1990s. On average, international acts of terrorism that targeted Americans in the 1980s killed, again, on average, 16 Americans per attack. In the 1990s, that average was three. The situation is not all that different domestically either. Nearly eight times more terrorist incidents, according to FBI statistics, were recorded in the United States in the 1980s as compared to the 1990s. Admittedly, the death rate in the United States was greater. 176 persons were killed by terrorists in America during the 1990s compared to 26 in the 1980s. But at the same time, viewed from a slightly different perspective, 95 percent of that total come from one single incident, the tragic, heinous bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. My point, though, is that of the 29 terrorist incidents recorded in the United States by the FBI in the 1990s, only four resulted in fatalities. So yes, Oklahoma is something we have to pay attention to, we have to prepare to, but Oklahoma City at the same time is not emblematic of the trend of terrorism in the United States. Now this isn't by any stretch of the imagination to suggest that the United States should become complacent about the threat of terrorism or that we should in any way relax our, vi relax our vigilance. Rather, what these statistics I think highlight is the asymmetry between, between perception and reality that a comprehensive terrorism threat assessment would go, go some way to addressing. Without such assessments, we risk adopting policies and making hard security choices based on misperception and miscalculation, rather than on hard analysis built on empirical evidence of the actual dimensions of the threat. Without ongoing, comprehensive reassessments, we cannot be confident that the range of policies, countermeasures, and defenses required to combat terrorism are the most relevant and appropriate ones for the United States. Regular systematic net assessments would also bring needed unity to the often excellent but nonetheless separate, fragmented, and individual assessments that the intelligence community carries out on a regular basis. This would enable us to present the big picture of the terrorist threat, which would facilitate both strategic analysis and the framing of an overall strategy. It would also profitably contribute to bridging the gap that lamentably has begun to exist between the criminal justice law enforcement approach to countering terrorism and that of the intelligence and national security, security approach. This dichotomy, which has characterized the United States, the United States' approach to terrorism during the 1990s, is not only myopic, but may also prove dangerous. In conclusion, only through a sober and empirical understanding of the terrorist threat will be able to focus our formidable resources where and when they can be most effective. The development of a comprehensive national strategy to combat terrorism would appreciably sustain the progress we've achieved in recent years in addressing the threat posed by terrorists to Americans and American interests both in this country and abroad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc Dr. Hoffman. General Clapper. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm uh, pleased to have this opportunity to speak on behalf of the advisory panel to assess domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction, less awkwardly known as the Gilmore panel after its chairman, uh, Governor Jim Gilmore of Virginia. I might mention that I guess uh, the epiphany experience for me with respect to terrorism was my participation as a senior intelligence investigator of, uh, in the aftermath of the uh, Cobar Towers uh, uh, attack in uh, June of 1996 in uh, Saudi Arabia. In the brief time I have for these remarks, I would, I'll cut to the chase on the two specific findings and recommendations in our last report uh, that you asked that we address. One, the lack of a national strategy, which has uh, already been spoken to uh, uh, at some depth this morning for combating uh, terrorism and that the uh, administration should develop one. And the other uh, major point was the malorganization of the federal government's programs and that the president should establish a national office for combating terrorism in the executive office of the president and seek a statutory basis for it. And uh, so our 
suggested solution uh, organizationally and structurally is uh, is different than what you heard this morning from um, Senator Rudman and, and uh, General Boyd. On strategy, it is our view after two years of looking at this that the nation now has many well-intended but often disconnected programs that aim individually to achieve certain preparedness objectives. Some have asserted that several policy and planning documents, such as the Presidential Decision Directives, PDDs, 39 and 62, the Attorney General's uh, 1999 uh, five-year plan, uh, which Mr. Gilman uh, mentioned, and the most recent annual report to Congress on, on combating terrorism, taken as a whole, constitute a national strategy. In our view, the view of the panel, these documents describe plans, various programs underway, and some objectives, but they do not, either individually or collectively, constitute a national strategy. We recommended in our report published in mid-December that the new administration develop an overarching national strategy by, by articulating national goals for combating terrorism, focusing on results rather than a process. We made three key assumptions on uh, about forging such a strategy, and I think these are uh, reflective of the uh, composition of our panel, which uh, was uh, heavily numbered with uh, state and local officials representing emergency planners, uh, fire chiefs, uh, police chiefs, and emergency medical people, public health people, and state emergency planners. So our uh, perspective, I think, it was a little bit different perhaps than uh, the Hart Rudman Commission because of the composition of our group, w which was heavily uh, influenced, heavily populated by state and local people. So the first assumption that we kept in mind in, uh, in suggesting uh, a national strategy was that local response entities w will always be the first and conceivably only response. In the case of a major, God forbid, cataclysmic attack, however you want to define it, no single jurisdiction is likely going to be capable of responding without outside assistance. And what we have in mind here is a multiple jurisdiction, perhaps a multiple state event, rather than one that is localized to a, a single locale or a single state. And maybe most important, we have a lot of capabilities that we have developed over many years for response to natural disasters, disease outbreaks, and accidents. So these capabilities can and should be used as a foundation for our capability to respond to a terrorist attack. I'd like to briefly highlight some of what our panel sees as the major attributes of such a strategy. It should be geographically and functionally comprehensive and should address both international and domestic terrorism in all its forms, chemical, biological, nuclear, conventional explosives, and cyber. It must encompass local, state, and federal in that order. It must include all of the functional constituencies, fire departments, emergency medical, police, public health, agriculture, et cetera. To be functionally comprehensive, the strategy we believe should address the full spectrum of the effort from crisis management as well as consequence management. And it must have objective measures in order to set priorities, allocate funds, measure progress, and establish accountability. The main point I would leave you with, res with respect to a national strategy for combating terrorism is that it must be truly national, not just federal. It should be from the bottom up, not the other way around. Our other major recommendation that we need somebody in charge, uh, a theme you've already uh, heard, is directly tied to, to devising a strategy. The uh, display boards uh, behind you are from our first report that we published at the end of 1999, it was our attempt to uh, depict uh, objectively uh, the uh, complexity of the federal, federal apparatus, so all the organizations and agencies and office that are in one degree or another have some responsibility for various phases of combating terrorism. We found that the perception of many state and local people is that the structures and processes at the federal level for combating terrorism are complex and confusing. The attempts that have been made to create a federal focal point for coordination with state and local officials, such as the uh, NDPO, have at best been only partially successful. Many state and local officials believe that federal programs are often created and implemented without including them. 
We don't think the current coordination mechanisms provide for the authority, coordination, discipline, and accountability that is needed. So for all these reasons, we recommended a senior authoritative entity in the Executive Office of the President, which we called the National Office for Combating Terrorism. Obviously a different construct than uh, the Hart-Rudman uh, Commission suggested. This would have the responsibility for developing the strategy and coordinating the programs and budget to carry out that strategy. We feel strongly that this office must be empowered to carry out several responsibilities, and I will, which are outlined in our full report. I will highlight three here by way of example. First and foremost, of course, is, is to develop and update the strategy, uh, which would, of course, be presented and, and approved by the President. Uh, the office should have a programming and budgeting responsibility uh, in, in which it, it can oversee and through the process of certifying or decertifying, ensuring that our uh, programs and budgets among all the, the plethora of, of departments and agencies are synchronized and coherent. And, and, uh, and an area that is of particular of interest and near and dear to my heart is, is the area of intelligence, uh, which Bruce has already spoken to. But uh, the, this office would also be responsible for coordinating intelligence matters to foster these, the, the national assessments that uh, Dr. Hoffman spoke to, to analyze both foreign and domestic intelligence uh, in, a, in a unitary way rather than as two separate uh, disparate uh, pursuits, and to devise policy for dissemination to appropriate uh, officials at the state and local uh, levels. We believe this office should have certain characteristics or attributes that we think are important. The person who heads the office should be politically accountable, that is, nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, and enjoy cabinet-level status. The office must have complete oversight over all the Federal programs and funding to influence resource allocation. It should be empowered to certify what each Department, agency, or office is spending in the interest of following the strategy, sticking with priorities, and minimizing duplication. Finally, the office should not have operational control over execution. Indeed, we don't want to see the various Federal stakeholders abrogate their responsibilities. What we do want to see is ha to have them carried out in a coherent, synchronized, coordinated way. In conclusion, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, the Gilmore panel members are convinced that these two recommendations are crucial to strengthening the, the national effort to combat terrorism. We need a true national strategy and we need somebody clearly in charge. This is not a partisan political issue. We have members on our panel who identify with each of the parties, virtually all the functional constituencies, and all governmental levels, federal, state, and local. This is simply something we, we all agreed that the country needs. Contemplating the specter of terrorism, as you are doing this morning in this country, is a sobering but critically necessary responsibility of government officials at all levels and in all branches. It is truly a national issue that requires synchronization of our efforts, vertically among the Federal, State, and local levels and horizontally among the functional constituent stakeholders. The individual capabilities of all critical elements must be brought to bear in a much more coherent way than is now the case. That fundamental tenet underlies our work over the last two years. Our most imposing challenge centers on policy and whether we have the collective fortitude forge change both in organization and process. I would respectfully observe that we have studied the topic to death and what we need now is action. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my brief statement. I'd be pleased to address your questions. Thank you, General Clapper. We'll reserve the opportunity of questioning you at the conclusion of our panel's uh, testimony. I now call on uh, Frank Salufo. Uh, Chairman, Committee on Combating Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Terrorism of the Homeland Defense Initiative Center for Strategic and International Studies. Please proceed. So even think tanks have an alphabet soup of acronyms <laughs> following this. <laughs> That's quite a lengthy one. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on a matter of critical importance to our nation's security. I want to echo the previous panelists and commend you for your foresight in seizing the occasion to identify gaps and shortfalls in our current policies, practices, procedures, and programs to combat terrorism. 
In considering how to best proceed, we should not be afraid to wipe the slate clean and review the matter anew, to thoroughly examine the myriad of presidential decision directives and policies with a view toward assessing what has worked to date, what has not, and what has not been addressed at all. This, in turn, lays the groundwork to proceed to the next craft next step of crafting an effective national counterterrorism strategy, a theme we've obviously heard a lot of today. My contribution to this hearing will focus predominantly on terrorism involving chemical, biological, radiologic, and nuclear weapons, or CBRN terrorism, and the threat to the homeland, though by and large I think the comments will be relevant, at least I hope, to counterterrorism more generally. During our deliberations, we concluded that although federal, state, and local governments have made impressive strides to prepare for terrorism, specifically terrorism using CBRN weapons, the whole remains far less than the sum of the parts. Let me briefly explain. The United States is now at a crossroads. While credit must be given where credit is due, the time has come for cold-eyed assessment and evaluation and the recognition that we presently do not have but are in need of a comprehensive strategy for countering the threat of terrorism and, I might add, the larger dimensions of homeland defense. As things presently stand, however, there is neither assurance that we have, clear, we have a clear capital investment strategy, nor a clearly defined end state, let alone a sense of the requisite objectives to reach this goal. Short of a crystal ball, and I do think it's fair to say that since the end of the Cold War, political forecasting has made astrology look respectable, but short of the crystal ball, there is no way to predict with any certainty the threat to the homeland in the short term or the long term. Though it is widely accepted, that unmatched U.S. cultural, diplomatic, economic, and military power will likely cause America's adversaries to favor asymmetric attacks in order to offset our strengths and exploit our weaknesses. Against this background, military superiority in itself is no longer sufficient to ensure our nation's safety. Instead, we need to go further by broadening our concept of national security so as to encompass CBRN counterterrorism. Make no mistakes, though. The dimension of the challenge is enormous. The threat of CBRN terrorism by states and non-state actors presents unprecedented challenges to American government and society as a whole. Notably, no single federal agency owns the strategic mission completely, nor do I think that's even a possibility. For the moment, however, many agencies are acting independently in what needs to be part of a whole. And importantly, a coherent response is not merely a goal that is out of reach. To the contrary, we now possess the experience and the knowledge for ascertaining at least the contours of a comprehensive strategy, a comprehensive response, and a future year program and budget to implement that strategy. It bears no mentioning that strategy must be a precursor to budget. Now there's a, there's a concept, huh? Uh, of course, none of this is to say that we have all the answers. Quite the contrary. Indeed, our recommendations represent just one possible course of action among many, and you've heard some others today, and it is for you, Congress, and the executive branch to decide precisely which of these avenues or combination thereof should be pursued. In any case, my vision of a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy would incorporate a full spectrum of activities, from prevention and deterrence to retribution and prosecution to domestic response preparedness. All too often, these, these elements of strategy are treated in isolation. Such a strategy must also incorporate the marshalling the marshalling of domestic resources and the engagement of international allies and assets. And it requires monitoring and measuring the effectiveness or benchmarking of the many programs that implement the strategy so as to lead to common standards, practices, and procedures. In our report on CBR and terrorism, we set out a roadmap of near-term and long-term priorities for senior federal government officials to marshal federal, state, local, private sector, and NGO resources to better counter the threat. With your patience, I will elaborate on, upon the highlights of our blueprint, beginning with a clear outline of the structure of our suggested strategy. In our view, a complete CBRN counterterrorism strategy involves both preventing an attack from occurring, our first priority should always be to get there before the bomb goes off, which includes deterrence, nonproliferation, counterproliferation, and preemption, and secondly, preparing federal, state, and local capabilities to respond to an actual attack. In short, our counterterrorism capabilities and organizations must be strengthened, streamlined, and then synergized so that effective prevention will enhance domestic response preparedness and vice versa. On the prevention side, a multifaceted strategy is, an, is in order. The common thread underpinning all of these, as we've heard earlier today, is the need for a first-rate intelligence capability. More specifically, the breadth, depth, and uncertainty of the terrorist threat demand significant investment, 
coordination and retooling of the intelligence process across the board for the pre-attack, the warning, trans-attack, possible preemption, and post-attack, whodunit phases. In the time that remains, I want to focus on issues of organization and domestic response preparedness. In my view, effective organization is the concept that not only lies at the heart of, the, of a comprehensive strategy, but also underpins it, underpins it from start, from prevention to finish, consequence management and response. We must ask ourselves whether we are properly organized to meet the CBRN terrorism challenge. This requires tackling very fundamental assumptions on national security. Are our existing structures, policies, and institutions adequate? CBRN terrorism is inherently a cross-cutting issue, but to date the government is organized along vertical lines within their respective stovepipes. Our report treats the wide-ranging question of organization by breaking it down into three different sub-themes, and you saw some of the comparison and contrast between uh, the NSSG and, and the Gilmore report here. Ours is actually a mishmash of both. Effective organization at the federal level, top-down, effective organization at the state and local levels, uh, and the federal interface, the bottom-up, and effective organization of the medical and public health communities, as you alluded to earlier, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thought I'd make some very brief remarks on, on each of these in, in turn. Um, as a starting point, we've heard to death that there's a need for, for better coordination of the 40-somewhat federal organizations that have a CT counterterrorism role. To ensure that departmental and agency programs, when amalgamated, constitute an integrated and coherent plan, we need a high-level uh, official to serve as what we, we refer to as, as a belly button um, for our overall efforts. And that position needs to marry up three criteria. And we keep hearing the same criteria, descriptions same, some of our prescriptions are different, but authority, accountability, and resources. One way to achieve this end in the course that we have suggested is to establish a Senate-confirmed position of assistant to the President or Vice President for combating terrorism. The assistant for combating terrorism would be responsible for issuing an annual national counterterrorism strategy and plan. This strategy would serve as the basis to recommend the overall level of counterterrorism spending and how that money should be allocated among the various departments and agencies of the federal government with CT responsibilities. Remember the golden rule, he or she with the gold rules. To work, the assistant must have some sway over departmental and agency spending. After all, policy without resources is rhetoric. Accordingly, we recommend the assistant be granted limited direction over departments and agencies' budgets in the form of certification and passback authority. Um, and, and that's not to get it mixed up with a czar. Uh, obviously, a czar needs COSACs, and I don't know too many of those around, and you have too many little czars. But, uh, but we do see the need to pull that away from the National Security Council, keep it in, the, obviously, the, the executive office of the president or vice president, and not get it confused with operations. It should have no operational responsibility, period. Let me make two very brief points on the lead federal agency. <clears throat> First, we need FEMA to assume the lead role in domestic response preparedness. We must capitalize FEMA with the personnel as well as administrative and logistical support and assign FEMA the training mission for consequence management. It makes little sense to hive off training for consequence management from the very organization that will handle consequence management now that rests at Department of Justice. Moreover, FEMA is already well integrated into state and local activity in the context of natural disasters. While FEMA has been revitalized and has distinguished itself when responding to a series of natural disasters recently, the same cannot be said of its national security missions. Put bluntly, it has become the ATM machine for chasing hurricanes. An additional point I wish to make concerns the role of the Department of Defense. Uh, obviously, this is a subject of much debate. Realistically, though, only Department of Defense even comes close to having the manpower and resources necessary for high-consequence yet low-likelihood events, such as catastrophic CBRN terrorism on, on the U.S. homeland. But even the mere specter or suggestion of a lead military role raises vocal and widespread opposition on the basis, foundedly, civil liberties. That being said, however, it is wholly appropriate for DOD to maintain a major role in support of civilian authorities though we must grant the department the resources necessary to assume this responsibility. Perhaps it's just me, but I find it difficult to believe that in a time of genuine crisis, the American people would take issue with what color uniform the men and women who are saving lives happen to be wearing. Even more starkly, the president should never be in a position of having to step up to the podium and say to the American people, look them in the eye, we coulda, shoulda, woulda, but didn't because of. Explaining to the American people the inside the Beltway debates just will not stand up in such a crisis. Moving now very briefly to state and local, 
obviously we need an effort to in a minute sure sure okay. um, on the state and local side we, we see the need for more resources to make their way uh, to, to, to state and local for implementation and execution um, obviously the the threat is perceived to be low and the, the cost exceedingly high that we need to be able to work toward nationwide baselines um, and and we need to be able to dictate that we have an optimal transition from an ordinary event responding to a heart attack to an extraordinary event. And, and, and I think that the value of training and exercising must not be underestimated. Hopefully it will be the closest we get to the real thing, and if not, it allows us to make some of the big mistakes on the practice field and not on, on, on the battlefield, which in this context could be Main Street USA. I'll skip the public health section, but I want to close very briefly on a personal note. Last year, on 19 April, I had the privilege to attend the dedication of the Oklahoma City National Memorial on the five-year anniversary of the attack on the Alfred P. Murrah Building. Just last week, I was again in Oklahoma City and had the opportunity to visit the Memorial Center's interactive museum. I highly recommend visiting the museum. It was profoundly moving. I was reminded that America is not immune from terrorism and that if such an attack can occur in America's heartland, it can occur anywhere. I was reminded that the consequences of such acts of violence are very real. In this case, 168 innocent lives were lost and many, many more affected. I was reminded that those first on the scene of such a tragedy are ordinary citizens, followed up by local emergency responders such as firefighters, medics, and police officers, all of whom were overwhelmed except for the desire to save lives. I was touched by the experience, of course, but most of all, I left proud. Proud of Oklahoma's elected officials, proud of the survivors, proud of the many thousands of men, women, and children who lost family members, friends, and neighbors, and perhaps most importantly, I left proud to be an American. For what I saw was the community's strength and resilience. I believe this indomitable spirit, the will of the people to return, to rebuild, to heal, and to prosper, best represents America's attitude toward terrorism. And I'm confident that with, with these hearings and all of our reports, that the, the people, the powers that be in the executive branch in Congress will develop, implement, and, and sustain such a strategy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Silufo. Um, I'm going to recognize um, my colleague from New York, but first let me put in the record, uh, Dr. Hoffman requested the executive summary of the RAN report, uh, strategy framework for countering terrorism and insurgency be placed in the record, and without objection, we'll be happy to do that. Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, uh, since I arrived late, I'd like to introduce into the record at this point in the record or at the appropriate place uh, my opening statement. That will be done without Thank objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address the entire panel uh, with uh, uh, one question. You all have focused on the need for uh, better coordination, avoid the fragmentation, put someone in charge, um, the need for a sound, effective, coordinated program. Uh, what has prevented us from doing that? Uh, the, uh, we go back to the Gilmore Commission, the Attorney General's report on a five-year interagency counterterrorism technology crime plan. All of these have focused on the same um, uh, conclusions, that we need to have a central agency, we need to have uh, coordination, we need to get rid of the fragmentation. What's prevented us from doing that over these years? And I address that to all of the panelists. I think, sir, that the uh, <clears throat> um, it's been somewhat of a function of, of perhaps uh, inertia, um, a unwillingness, a reluctance to ste step up to the recognition of uh, at least the potential threat here to uh, uh, to reposture. Um, there is the issue, I suppose, of uh, giving up. Uh, the, the, the concern about giving up turf uh, jurisdiction uh, and to make do with uh, sort of interagency coordination processes which um, uh, basically diffuse uh, responsibility and accountability. And there's been, I think, a reluctance to, to step up to the, the notion of, of perhaps having to give up uh, some authority or turf in the interest of having someone who is clearly in, uh, in charge and who is in, uh, accountable. Uh, thank you, uh, General Clapper. Mr. Hoffman, Dr. Hoffman, do you have some comment? I, it's something of a chicken and the egg question, but I think it's the absence of a strategy that has uh, deprived us of a focus that would enable us to marshal our efforts and to 
focus on how to address the threat through organizations. I think this, the trouble is it's, it's much too fragmented and piecemeal, and it represents too many different things to too many different agencies. Uh, but, Dr. Huffman, we have these reports, the U.S. Commission on National Security, Gilmore Commission, Attorney General Report, all said we need a national strategy. What I'm asking is what has prevented us from adopting it? What can we do to overcome that inertia that General Clapper is referring to? I think it's the, the na a national will to bring together this comprehensive net assessment, that it has to start from that position, and it has to come from the executive. What do you recommend that we bring, how do we bring that about? I think that there has to be, an, firstly, the process of, uh, of net assessments has to begin, whereas we take the disparate pieces that have been used to define the threat and bring it together and have at least a, a coherent definition of what we need to plan against. And I think that would better identify what the requirements are than to approach it in the direction we do now without a... But I think we've all, the experts have all identified the problem. What I'm asking is how do we implement now the recommendations that the, uh, from the, the problem that you've assessed? Well, there's, that, there's probably Chair. two ways that can happen, sir. E either the, uh, the executive uh, can uh, step up to um, uh, the task and uh, champion a strategy uh, and uh, assume a position of leadership, or that uh, direction can come from this institution. Mr. Gilman, Mr. if Mr. I Lofo. can also Mr. expand on that briefly. I, I agree that the executive branch plays a, a key role here. While we have seen a lot of talk the past eight years could be summed up, and perhaps unfairly, long on nouns, short on verbs. There was a lot of focus, but very little action and implementation. I think that you clearly have to get someone who's above the, the specific agency roles and missions. So I can only see that coming from the leadership. And, and that has to be someone, because you have different roles and missions. For example, law enforcement wants to string them up. The intelligence community wants to string them along. It's not that, they're, they're, that they don't necessarily fight, but they've got very different missions in terms of, of their perceptions of the world. And, and I think that... Um, there are only two times in our rich, yet relatively speaking, young na nation, uh, history where we really needed to ask these very fundamental questions, and those were the, the founding fathers, uh, the very issue of the federalism debates, and then again right after World War II, where we created the National Security Act of 1947, where we saw the need to, to turn OSS into the Central Intelligence Agency. So I think this is unprecedented in terms of timing, w in, in terms of asking the very basic national security needs and, and, and architectures we need to have in place. But I think that uh, with the new administra in administration in place and, and some of the, the principal cabinet members, this, this will happen. Uh, Mr. Gilman. Uh, yes, Mr. Wentworth. A further, further answer. It, it really is a leadership issue. But, but it's, it's more than that, too. And if you, if you look at these charts, all of these agencies have very clear statutory responsibilities, and, and all of the ones that are sitting there on the table will have pieces of this, depending... It's obvious we've got too much fragmentation. We, we do, but, but let, let me suggest that part of the process in terms of, of accountability and responsibility is following the money. One of the specific recommendations that the Gilmore Commission makes in terms of its structure <coughs> is giving a senior person in the White House some budget responsibility, certification and decertification, requiring all of these agencies to bring their budgets to a table, to eliminate duplication, to, to match their budgets against the priorities established in the national strategy. So it, it has to be a focus that's centralized with all respect to the, to the proposal from, from Hart Rudman. If this isn't done in the White House at a very senior level with someone who is sitting very close to the president and has the, the president's authority uh, to do it all, we came to the conclusion that a, an agency, a single agency, would never be able to pull all of this together. And, and I think, uh, to a certain extent, that view is reflected in the CSIS recommendation that it needs to be in the White House, that there needs to be some senior oversight over this entire uh, mishmash of organizations. Mr. Gilman, could I build yes. on that very briefly, and, and if I could be so bold, I sort of feel like a fisherman being asked his views on hoof and mouth. Um, obviously, it's, it's a problem, and uh, I'm here to tell you it's worse. But I think that Congress also needs to look at how it is organized to deal with this challenge. Right now, you've got a series of both 
author committees with with authorization oversight, and everyone claims well, that. Well, that's that's what this committee's all about. And We're that's doing why the I oversight. Think this We're trying to focus on that problem. But more important, if I might interrupt you, more important, we, uh, uh, Mr. Wormuth said we need someone at close to the White House. Several years ago, there was a national coordinator appointed within the Security Council to take uh, the responsibility. What I'm asking our panelists, and you're all experts now, how best can we implement the recommendations that are obvious to all of us to have a national strategy, to get rid of the uh, uh, fragmentation, to make it an effective coordinated policy? How best can this Congress uh, act to accomplish that? On, on the any, NSC. any recommendations by our panelists? Well, sir, I, I try to suggest that uh, if uh, if the legislative uh, or if the executive branch, the new, the new administration, takes this on and devises a strategy and appoints a leadership with sufficient uh, staff wherewithal and, uh, and the authority to include uh, program and resources, I would hope that such a move would be uh, endorsed by the Congress. In the absence of that, then I guess I would suggest that uh, to the extent that people think this is an important issue, that these things need to be fixed, that the Congress would uh, legislate, uh, as they have in the past, uh, to, to mandate the creation of such a national strategy and uh, the appointment of a, uh, of a leader. Well, General Clapper, I welcome your recommendation. What do you think about the uh, report by Senator Rudman today of uh, 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 bringing about a commission and securing the... Sir, if you're referring to the, uh, the Redmond their, Commission, their proposal for a Homeland Security Agency yes. and embellished uh, FEMA. So we spent in our commission, uh, our panel, a lot of time uh, looking at various models of um, <laughs> what might be the best construct for uh, a lead element in the government. And so we went through uh, a, lead uh, a lead agency picking one of the current departments uh, of the government, whether it's defense or justice or health and human services, and basically for lots of reasons rejected that. We looked at the notion of a, uh, an embellished, strengthened uh, FEMA, and we're concerned there about uh, the uh, mixture of law enforcement and uh, consequence management kinds of responsibilities. And of course, one of the major law enforcement elements, the FBI itself, would, would of course not be uh, in, in, this, uh, in this construct. Uh, the other uh, difficulty we saw was a, a, an agency, a sub-cabinet agency, somehow directing uh, the coordination across uh, cabinet-level agencies. So we just decided that uh, FEMA, which has been uh, very, very successful, uh, particularly under its recent leadership, is very well thought of. I have learned uh, through my interactions with state and local people by state and local officials, and that we shouldn't jeopardize uh, the, the very important mission that it performs, perhaps uh, embellish that and give them more resources, but not uh, jeopardize what it does now by uh, uh, adding on these these uh, these other agencies. So our conclusion, and again, I would mention that I think the uh, nature of our recommendations was heavily influenced by the composition of our panel, which was heavily populated by state and local people, was uh, an entity in the executive office of the president, uh, account politically accountable, uh, appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, which would have uh, this oversight and authority over the entire range of all these agencies and their programs, all individually well intended, but not necessarily coordinated, and, and, and that would be the entity to do that. Thank you, General. Do any of the panelists disagree with General Clapper's conclusion? Well, I, I wouldn't say disagree, but different areas of emphasis. I do not think the breakdown is where the rubber meets the road, and it's at the agency level. So I'm not sure if we really do need an agency, nor do I think we should ever have a super agency, because it gets to some of the very fundamental presumptions of, 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 of American ethos. But um, I think that the real problem is at the policy level, and, and a lot of that stems from 
policy without resources is rhetoric. You need someone who can marry up authority accountability with resources. The budgetary role, which I think both of our reports uh, uh, alluded to, accentuated in different ways, is, is where the real problem, where the real breakdown is. Well, thank you. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Thank uh, the witnesses for being here today. Uh, General Clapper, I uh, looked at your testimony here uh, about the major elements of a national strategy. Uh, do you think preliminary to the execution of such a uh, strategy, there would have to be a comprehensive uh, risk assessment nationally? Is that is yes, sir? And, and uh, <clears throat> that that topic was. Um addressed uh, quite uh, substantially in our first annual uh, first report that we published in 1999, which uh, uh, Dr. Hoffman had a, lot, a great deal to do with uh, since he, he was working with us then. So we treated um, that subject, the whole issue of threat and the need for uh, threat assessments, uh, much along the lines of what uh, Dr. Hoffman uh, testified to in our first report. So the, the short answer to your question is yes. Thank you, General. Um, now, I, I looked at your testimony, and you say the national stra you speak to a national strategy should be geographically and functionally comprehensive, should address both international and domestic terrorism. Then you go on to say that the distinction between terrorism outside the borders of the United States and terrorist uh, threats domestically is eroding. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I think in many uh, we we've had a, uh, a proclivity, I think, has been in, uh, historically to, to sort of separate domestic uh, threats with uh, as as one set and and those emanating from foreign sources uh, as another. And of course, as we've seen, World Trade Center being, I think, uh, an example that that uh, those, those nice, neat uh, boundaries uh, probably are not going to going to apply. I think this is particularly true in the case of the cyber threat and the potential terrorist threat posed in the in the cyber uh, uh, world or the cyber cyber arena, where the long arm of terrorism can reach out from uh, anywhere else in the world and and be reflected as an apparent domestic uh, attack. And I think the, the mechanisms and the apparatus, the jurisdictional distinctions that we have in this country uh, uh, are going to be put to the test because of that erosion between um, heretofore distinct uh, foreign threats and, and domestic. Would you agree that the uh, FBI and the CIA have uh, distinct and uh, quite different missions in this government. They, they do, although I think they have done a, a lot towards working together in recognition of the fact that the, there is the, the terrorists don't necessarily recognize uh, political boundaries. So, so you see, would you see then more of a role for the Central Intelligence Agency in uh, domestic intelligence gathering? Uh, no, sir, I, I don't. I, I, what I see is what they're doing, and uh, what I hope uh, continues to uh, to occur, which is a, a close working relationship, so that the uh, when the baton is handed off, so to speak, that there it's not dropped between uh, when there is evidence that a foreign emanating uh, foreign em em emanated uh, threat is reaching into the United States, that that baton is handed off, so to speak, between. The CIA, which has a, a clear foreign uh, intelligence charter, and the FBI, which has a domestic intelligence charter. Your sense is that right now we don't have a national intelligence gathering apparatus. Is that what you're saying? No, I didn't say that at all, sir. We do. Uh, uh, one, of the, one, of, one of the elements of our, uh, the entity that we are suggesting, that the National Office for Combating Terrorism, would be a robust intelligence uh, effort under the the uh, the national coordinator who would be the uh, who would serve to bridge uh, both the foreign intelligence uh, overseen by the director of central intelligence and the domestic intelligence and we we would see that as a, a major coordinating so be, role as a part of that national office general would we be hiring new people then to do the uh, national intelligence gathering i don't think so sir i think uh, a few perhaps but i think what this really represents is is somewhat uh, the same theme that um, senator rudman was speaking of which and general boyd which is a, a rearraying, perhaps, in a more efficient, ma coherent manner 
to deal with uh, what this threat represents. Uh, in your testimony, you say that to be functionally comprehensive, the national strategy should address the full spectrum of the nation's efforts against terrorism. And number one, you put uh, intelligence. So what, what role does intelligence have then in your uh, Homeland Security Act? Well, I think uh, intelligence uh, is a key, as, as Dr. Hoffman testified, is a key element of this. It should uh, underpin our national strategy. I think there is a lot that can be done to disseminate intelligence, regardless of where it comes from, whether it's foreign or domestic, to uh, selected appropriate state and local officials. We have many intelligence sharing relationships with foreign countries, so we certainly ought to be able to figure out mechanisms whereby we can share intelligence, for example, with state governors or senior emergency planners uh, in the states and selected local officials. Right now, there's not a real good mechanism for doing that. I would think, uh, and our report describes that this is a role that the National Office for Combating Terrorism could perform in the, in the specifically the intelligence staff that we would envision that would be a part of it. I'm looking uh, at these dozens of agencies and departments here which uh, have various intelligence functions. Um, I'd like to focus on the Federal Bureau of Investigation for a moment. Are, are, would, would it be your opinion that the FBI uh, is not doing an adequate job in handling matters and challenges relating to um, intelligence gathering for the purposes of protecting the United States against domestic terrorism? No, sir, I, I would not say that. And, and, on, and on the contrary, I would uh, emphasize something I said earlier, that I think a lot of progress has been made in um, because of what we've experienced uh, uh, in terms of a closer working relationship between the CIA and the, the FBI. So I, as a uh, lifelong uh, professional uh, intelligence officer, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I'm certainly not suggesting that they're not doing their job. They could certainly do it better if they had more resources. Well, it, it, we've had testimony in front of this committee, Mr. Chairman that would imply that we have a, uh, a profound national security challenge here. And if, uh, if we do, uh, it would seem to me that the FBI would be the appropriate agency to deal with it and not create a, uh, an, an entirely new governmental agency. Uh, I share with you the opinion that we have, that the Federal Bureau of Investigation uh, does an excellent job uh, in, in handling a variety of challenges of a law enforcement nature, uh, it, it seems to me that the Federal Bureau of Investigation has the specific charge to handle a number of the um, elements of a national strategy that you have already spoken to. Yes, sir, in a domestic... May I, may, I'm, I'm not finished, General, if I may. Uh, speaking of in, uh, intelligence, deterrence, prevention, investigation, prosecution, <clears throat> preemption, crisis management, consequence management, that almost defines what the Federal Bureau of Investigation is about, and at least the, the bureau that I'm familiar with. And it seems to me that in offering an entirely new structure here, uh, we may be wading into waters of uh, duplicating uh, existing federal functions. No, sir. On the, on, I, on the contrary, uh, and first of all, I'm not suggesting a. Uh, we weren't in our report a a a profound new agency. What we are suggesting is a comparatively small staff effort att uh, appended to the office of the president uh, to ensure it has the 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 focus and the responsibility and, and the authority. And what we're really talking about, I believe, is simply marshalling the totality of uh, and focusing on the totality of our intelligence effort by uh, co ensuring coordination between the foreign and the, and the domestic. The CIA, in the foreign intelligence context, has potentially a role to play in all those dimensions that, that you enumerated. Uh, in virtually every, in every case, I believe, the CIA potentially would have a role to play as well in, in, uh, in working in partnership with, with the FBI. And then if that's, if that's the case, then, uh, the CIA would inevitably become involved in matters relating to uh, handling of uh, domestic uh, law enforcement challenges. Uh, no, sir, I, I don't, uh, 
I don't think so. I think this would be in every case, it, as it is done now, that where the FBI, if it turns into a domestic uh, scenario, and we're, we're hypothesizing here, <clears throat> the CIA, I think, would be uh, in in support of uh, if it turns into a domestic uh, situation in support of the FBI. I, I don't. Sharing, see, I do not see the intelligence. CIA. I'm sorry, sir. They'd be sharing intelligence. Yes, sir. And they do that now. Yes, sir. And what do they do with the intelligence they share? If it's a uh, domestic matter, the CIA would give it to the FBI and the FBI would handle it. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand your, your, well, I'm your question. I'm just going back to the point that I'm making, and that is that um, we talk about a Homeland Security Act, and I'm just wondering uh, what's uh, – there, there's implied here a criticism of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's abilities to respond. Uh, no, sir, uh, I, I don't uh, think that's implied at all. Well, I would, I would think that if we're talking about creating a, uh, a reorganization here of some sort and with new oversight structure, with budgetary authority, as, as uh, Mr. Solidifel had uh, talked about, uh, we're certainly talking about something new. And, and you cannot uh, countenance such a discussion without it reflecting on uh, the service of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to this country. And, and, you, and one final comment, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your indulgence. Um, I agree with all of the panelists about the role of presidential, uh, of presidential policymaking, because that really helps to set the tone as to what a Homeland Security Act would, uh, what, what milieu it would operate in, in terms of policy. And I see two paradigms, Mr. Chairman, and I'll just be completed here. Uh, if we look at a paradigm or a model of cooperation with other nations uh, in, in solving security challenges, uh, then this uh, Homeland Security Act could be uh, beneficent in its scope. On the other hand, if a president, any president, began a, to ramp up the rhetoric and <clears throat> become involved in a Cold War type atmosphere, if we go into a new Cold War theater with uh, implied uh, threats, confrontation with other nations, a Homeland Security Act in its scope would necessarily have a totally different meaning. Uh, this is not, as you state, this is not neutral with respect to uh, the policy that comes from the executive. So it has to be, I think, always we have to think in terms of the context of the operation of the act and the uh, international and national policy of an administration. And so if we, are, if we enter into a Cold War type scenario again, uh, this particular uh, uh, proposal would have implications that uh, some may feel would be quite challenging for the maintenance of civil liberties in our society. I thank the chairman for his indulgence. We're going to have opportunity to have dialogue back and forth. Uh, this is the last panel, and we only have four members. And at this time, uh, I'd recognize uh, Mr. Tierney. And we'll go for a second round. I still have my first to do. Okay. Thank you. I uh, try not to cover any of the other ground and apologize. I was at another committee meeting on that. Uh, General Clapper, you, I believe, talked a little bit about a comprehensive terrorist, terrorism policy. Uh, and in that, are you also factoring in uh, nuclear issues, threats from nuclear issues? And if so, how do you go about prioritizing which is the more serious concern for us at any given time, a threat from a nuclear uh, problem well, or a threat from uh, terrorism? From a, pro from a process standpoint, uh, I, would, uh, I would reinforce what uh, Dr. Hoffman spoke to, which is, is the necessity for having a the nationally sanctioned, nationally recognized uh, threat assessment, which would deal with specifically uh, those issues. Now, those are not static. They're not uh, set in concrete. That, that could change. From personal opinion, I, I'm inclined to agree with Senator Rudman. I think uh, our current main focus uh, perhaps ought to be in the, in the, in the chemical and, and biological uh, arena. Although I would comment that the weapon of choice continues to be for terrorists uh, a vehicle-borne uh, conventional explosive. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Sulefo, 
you talked about having, or you alluded to, a substantial amount of good news that deserves to be told. Uh, will you tell us, you know, being aware of some of the critical challenges we face, what have been the accomplishments in your view in the last uh, decade or so? Sure. I, I do think there are some pockets of, of, of very good news, um, ranging from state and local exercises, which never seem to make its way, though, what goes on in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, what goes on in, in, in Denver, Colorado, as we saw in, in a major exercise called Top Off, often stays in those cities. So while there have been some specific exercises, there have been some programs that, that are highly successful. State Department's foreign emer for FEST team um, and, and the role uh, linking in CDC and, and, and USAMRID within the Department of Defense into those programs are, are highly successful. But, but again, the, the, the whole remains far less than the sums of the pieces. And, and until you start looking at ways to, to work toward common standards, baselines, uh, and the like, you're going to continue to have uh, some, some uh, areas of excellence, but other areas that are neglected. Let me ask the other witnesses what, what they see uh, have been the biggest improvements over the last eight or ten years. I'm perhaps too much down in the weeds, but I would have to say, at least in the intelligence realm, it was the creation of the counterterrorism ca counterterrorist center at the Central Intelligence Agency that, on the one hand, knits together both the operational and intelligence sides of that agency, but also is an all-community entity that involves the FBI and all other agencies involved in anticipating foreign terrorist threats. And I think the, the proof, frankly, in a sense, I think has been demonstrated that it's had a very good record in deflecting and thwarting terrorist acts in recent years. General? Sir, I've been uh, very impressed with the uh, commitment and the, the uh, concern at the state and local level. This was, uh, as a uh, federal servant, my whole professional career, is that this is not an area I was very familiar with. And through my uh, engagement with the Gilmore panel and the SecDef Threat Reduction Advisory Committee and some other boards and panels I've been on, I've really been impressed by what is, go what is going on at the state and local level. In fact, I've been so impressed with it that I think that's really where the focus needs to be. I think there's a tendency on the part of us Beltway denizens to sort of look from the top down, and there's a lot of, a lot of good work a lot of sophistication, I might add, at the state and local level about what's, what's involved and what's needed. And um, there's a great commitment out there. What the federal level needs to do, I think, is to get its act together and complement and support and buttress what is, going on, what is going on at the state and local level. Can I just interject, would you do that with what, research and resources? Well, actually, there's, <clears throat> as in our, indicated in our second report, there are a range of activities where the, the federal the federal level can facilitate and support uh, exercises and training, equipment standards, uh, medical planning, where uh, the federal government, that's a, that's a function that at the national, from a national perspective, I think uh, that leadership has to come from the federal government. Thank you. Yes, I'm and, sorry. And if I could just expand on that a bit, and this is a, a view that's slightly different than the one that, uh, that Senator Rudman and General Boyd espoused earlier, that some of the really good news has been in the actual activities and programs undertaken at the state and local level. There is a lot going on out there. In fact, uh, personal view is the, that most state governments and even some larger municipal areas are much better organized, much further along in their thinking about how to approach this problem than the federal government is. Uh, there's, a, there's a process called emergency management assistance compacts. It's agreements between states to help each other in the event of an emergency like this or natural disaster. And those are now in place in, in 42 states, and that continues to, to grow every day until we're, gonna, we're probably going to be at 50 before the end of this year. There are some great stories to be told in terms of multi-jurisdictional uh, uh, compacts and agreements within states. Uh, the Los Angeles area in California now has a consortium of some 72 jurisdictions that are focused on terrorism. They have a terrorism early warning group, a working group where all these jurisdictions get together and plan how they would respond. So those are great stories out there in the heartland and what General Clapper mentioned, supporting those efforts, supporting their plans to, to create incident command systems, unified command so that they can approach this, uh, the, uh, the possibility of an attack 
uh, cohesively when the attack occurs, and that would mean then integrating the support as well from the from the federal level. It might have to be brought to bear if the incident were large enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. I'd first like to ask each of uh, all four of you. What was said by the previous panel that you uh, would disagree with? So I think the only thing uh, we disagree on is the, um, uh, the instrumentality or the entity for, uh, to put someone in charge. Our construct in the Gilmore Commission was a, uh, an office uh, tethered to the, pre the office of the president as opposed to um, embellishing FEMA. Other than that, I think we are in pretty much uniform agreement, certainly on, on the need, on the threat, on the need for a strategy, and on the need for a uh, firm, of, for assertive leadership. But uh, I think the, the issue is implementation. And as Senator Rubin said, there's probably uh, a number of ways that this can be accomplished. Uh, the important thing is the recognition of the need, uh, the threat, and, uh, and to have a, a national strategy. Dr. Hoffman? I think, well, my expertise is more in the area of terrorist organizations and motivations than in the U.S. bureaucracy, so it's, it's, I have a different perspective. I would focus on their depiction of the threat. I think that fundamentally the United States, I don't disagree completely, but I think the United States has to be capable of responding along the entire spectrum of terrorist threats, not just the high-end ones. And I think that's important because there's a difference between WMD terrorism and terrorist use of chemical, biological, or radiological weapon that could not be at all motivated to kill lots of people, but could be motivated to have profound psychological repercussions. And I think the terrorists realize that, and that has to be as much a factor. We've responded, I think, very much to the physical consequences and to emergency management. Uh, I think we also have to <coughs> focus equal attention on the psychological repercussions. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Worth. The Hart-Rudman proposal on structure envisions, at, at least in, in, in our reading of their proposal, a super federal agency that somehow is in charge. We have suggested, the Gilmore panel has suggested that the likelihood of the of the entity being in charge is, is is most probably going to be the local either the mayor or perhaps the governor and and more so inside the state uh, our proposal suggests that you don't need someone at the federal level being in operational control a single entity because all these agencies have part of that you need to coordinate that piece in advance so that everyone clearly understands the role of all of these agencies and then provide the support mechanism to whichever lead federal agency might be selected depending on the type of the incident and particularly to support the, the state and local entity that, that probably is going to be really in charge of handling the overall response. It, it's different in approach. Hart Rudman in the, in the short definition is top down the Gilmore Commission approach is bottom-up, recognizing that state and local entities are likely going to be the entities clearly first responding and, and really in charge of the situation, and the federal piece is going to be a support mechanism. So bottom line, though, again, uh, with the general, it's the issue of how you structure the response. Sorry. That's correct. Um, Mr. Salufo? Well, we too, uh, on, in terms of description, are, are very much singing off the same sheet of music. Music. It's it's where the prescriptions. But with the general and, and actually or, or, with both Hart and Rudman and with with the uh, Gilmore okay. panel, it's we don't see it as a top down or a bottom up. We see it as the convergence of both, and we placed more emphasis on the public health communities, but we didn't get to discuss the bioterrorism challenge in in, in great depth and the threats to agriculture and the threats to to livestock. But, but, but the big issue is, is we all see the same need. We see the need for a whole slew of gaps, and they're all pretty much on, on the same uh, topic. We see this, the need to marry up the same three criteria, authority, accountability, and resources. We, too, did see the need, need to enhance and capitalize FEMA. We just didn't see the need to, to 
balloon it as, as large as it may have been and incorporating other agencies and missions that have other very important missions at hand. Um, so in reality, it's sort of a, a, a mix and match of, of all of the above here. Yeah. Um, I think we would all agree that the attack uh, in Oklahoma was done by a terrorist. Is that true? I mean, there's a, Correct. But, but um, uh, more or less siding with you, Dr. Hoffman, on this issue, it wasn't a weapon of mass destruction. But let me ask, as it relates to weapons of mass destruction, I, the world, um, the Cold War is over. I view the world as a more uh, threatening environment, uh, that um, it's a more dangerous place. I happen to believe the Cold War is over and the world is a more dangerous place. Dr. Hoffman, do you believe um, that it's not a question of if there will be a terrorist attack using weapons of mass destruction, but a question of when. I'm going to ask the same question of you, General, and, and you, Mr. Wirth Wormuth, and you, Mr. Salufo. If you phrase it in terms of mass destruction, I would disagree with that. Okay. General Clapper? The question, sir, is, is when? Yeah, not if. In the next 10 to 20 years. Um, well, I, I guess I would... I would, I would be more concerned about, uh, again, the, the uh, uh, I mean, we have to be concerned with a full spectrum of, of threats. We can't just uh, pick one and, and, and disregard the other. But I, I think the, mo the more likely threats uh, will remain, at least as far as I can see, the, the conventional, perhaps large yeah, but, you scale. You know, that's not really the question explosive. I asked. And, and Dr. Hoffman, you, you've, been, you've been clear. You believe there will be no... Um, attack by a terrorist in the next 10 to 20 years using a weapon of mass destruction. That's what you believe. In or against the United States, yes, but I would qualify that by saying a chemical or a nuclear, a chemical or biological or radi a radiological weapon, that I do believe. Okay, well, let me mass step... Mass destruction, Paul. Uh, well, yeah, I view, I view chemical, biological, and <coughs> nuclear as... They are defined as weapons of mass destruction, aren't they? I mean, am I misusing the term? Well... I, no. Go ahead, Bruce. No, I, I, I think incorrectly. I think there are three different weapons that have very different... Uh, okay, let's break it down. Well, let me, and I, I do want to be very clear on this. I, okay. You know, you all are, have been involved in this issue a lot longer than I have, but I ended up asking to chair this committee with the proviso that we would have jurisdiction of terrorism at home and abroad. I happen to think what I've been reading for the last, uh, frankly, for the last 10 to 20 years make me very fearful. Uh, so I have uh, my own bias about this, but uh, I will, let me just ask you uh, as it relates to each of the three. Chemical, uh, we'll, we'll separate nuclear as a weapon of mass destruction. I'll put chemical and biological together <coughs> and ask each of you if you think that the United States will face an attack by terrorists using these weapons. First, nuclear, Dr. Hoffman. I would put nuclear on the low end of the spectrum, but phrased chemical, biological, radiological, yes, I do. So it's a question of when, not if. And those two. Uh, it's a, it's a, yes. Yes. Do, General Clapper. I agree with that. Okay. Mr. Wormuth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question uh, a little bit differently by saying that it, it's, it's easy to say it's a question of, uh, it, it, it's not a question of if but when, but that really goes to the heart of what we're talking about. I believe that, that terrorists will attempt to use chemical and biological weapons. Those, those I would kind of put in the same category. Radiological and nuclear, I would say that the chances of that are no. But I don't even think you can say for chemical and biological that it's not a question of if but when, unless you're doing what we're all saying here, unless you're collecting good intelligence, unless you're analyzing that good intelligence. I'm unwilling to say that, that there will be a mass destructive attack in the next 20 years because I don't think anybody has that crystal ball. We don't have any intelligence right now that indicates that anyone has that capability, but we have to keep watching it. Wait, 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 wait a second. Uh, that, 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 you, you misspoke. You clearly have uh, intelligence that people have the capability. We, we, we have intelligence that nation states have capability. We don't have any intelligence that any terrorist group or individual currently possesses the capability to deliver a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear attack against the United States presently that would result in casualties in the thousands or tens of thousands. Okay. Um, with all due respect, uh, I would accept that on nuclear, but could I just, and we'll get to you, Mr. Salufo, um, I, I, am, I am really unclear as to how you can make a statement that there is not the technology for uh, an individual cell of people, I mean a group, a small number of people, 
to mount a terrorist attack using a chemical agent that would have devastating uh, uh, injury and death. I, I, I tried to be very careful I know, with I don't my want choice you to be so of words. Careful. I said no current intelligence that indicates that anyone currently possesses the capability. Is the technology there? Could they try to, de to acquire the capability? Could they culture and perhaps transport and deliver an attack? Yes, that's in the realm of possibility, but there's nothing to indicate that any entity currently possesses that capability where they could well, they now, deliver Well, now, in, the in Japan, they didn't pull it off. Didn't they, uh, didn't they have the capability? Uh, I, I, you know, Dr. Hoffman's more of an expert on this than I am, but I would argue that they didn't have the capability because they didn't have the effective means of delivering <laughs> what it was they wanted to deliver so that the result was mass fatalities. That was clearly their intention. Yeah, they did and not I, have and the I, And I would argue, but, but, but I'm probably foolish to do it, uh, given Dr. Hoffman and you all are such experts, but I would argue that they didn't pull off what they had the capability of doing. They, uh, uh, they punctured uh, plastic garbage bags with umbrellas as a means of dissemination. They did not have a capability effectively to disseminate the agent that they had in their possession. Uh, that was in part because they didn't want to hurt themselves in the process. <laughs> uh, the, the issue of, uh, you know, we have the mutual assured destruction uh, seemed to, to matter to nations. It doesn't seem to matter to terrorists when they're willing to blow themselves up in the process. Um, so if they had been willing to release them uh, and, and, and do it manually, they might have succeeded. And they had the technology. They just had to do it in person. Mr. Slufo? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Nor can you bomb an actor without an address, so yeah. deterrence needs to be rethought. Say that again? Nor can you bomb an actor without an address, so okay. deterrence and compellence in terms of our national strategy needs to be rethought out in terms of forward deployment and projection of power. It's a little different. This requires personalizing, knowing some very specific information on what could be a very small cell or, or, or organization right. or group. Uh, in terms of likelihood, um, Not a matter of, of if, but when, on first nuclear yes. and then... Um, I agree on the bio, on the chem side, with the caveat, it depends on consequences. You, you may have small-scale biological or limited-scale chemical attacks that could be, in some cases, even major, major events, worse than in Oklahoma City, but that doesn't mean necessarily an attack that will damage the f fabric of, of American society. But with that in mind, yes, I do think. I, I, the capabilities, as you referenced, exist. The intentions exist. There's no shortage of actors with views inimical to the United States out there in the world. It's when you see the marriage of the real bad guys wanting to exploit the real good things. And, and uh, luckily, we have not seen that yet, but I do think uh, we will. See, my, my, my feeling about terrorists is they just don't have as good imagination as I have, uh, which is, which, I mean, seriously. Let's keep I mean, it that way. Yeah, well, it, uh, and it's not a challenge to them, but, but um, Millstone two, uh, 1, 2, and 3 are probably almost as far away from me as they are from Congressman Tierney. What would prevent uh, terrorists from coming in and exploding that uh, plan up and uh, in a sense, not causing maybe the deaths uh, in the thousands and thousands, but uh, certainly uh, it would make all of, uh, of lower uh, west eastern Connecticut uninhabitable for the next 10,000 10, years. What would prevent that? I mean, do, do, you have to, do you have to have some great weapons to do that? Uh, Dr. Hoffman, tell me first about Tokyo and then respond to that question I just asked. Well, I... Uh in Tokyo, I would say what's interesting in the case of the OM is they had something on the order of 50 scientists working full time precisely on the means to develop and deploy chemical and probably fewer than 20 scientists biological weapons. They attempted through more sophisticated techniques than puncturing trash bags to use biological weapons nine times through aerosol sprayers and the like, and it failed. That's why they moved on to chemical. They thought it was easier. And I think the, the lesson is not that some other terrorist group may not succeed them, may not indeed learn from their mistakes, because one thing we do know that I think all terrorist experts will agree on is that terrorists learn from their mistakes much better than governments, the governments that they're arrayed against. But I think what the Ohm case shows is that this is far more difficult to develop an effective chemical or biological weapon and then to achieve the dispersal. On two other occasions, Ohm did use chemical weapons and used more sophisticated aerosol spraying devices, and it also didn't work. I think this is, this is part of the issue, too, is that, and that goes to your question, why wouldn't terrorists use some of these more heinous 
types of weapons. And I think, on the one hand, it's because terrorists know that they have a problematical effectiveness. Let's look at the last conventional conflict where chemical weapons were used and were used promiscuously by um, Iraq against the Iranians during the Iran-Iraq War. Chemical weapons accounted for fewer than 5 percent of, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I'm right about that. Sorry, fewer than 1 percent. 5,000 of the 600,000 fatalities in that war were killed with chemical weapons. And I have to say, in World War I, although the first use of chemical weapons shocked many people, fewer than 12 percent of the casualties were with gas. So these, I think, psychologically are very powerful weapons, which the terrorists realize. And they realize that using them in a very discreet way will have profound psychological repercussions that I would argue we're not as prepared to deal with as perhaps the physical repercussions of them. And Tokyo is a perfect example. The figure of over 5,000 persons injured in that attack is widely cited. But an issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association last year confirmed that approximately 75 percent of all those quote unquote um, injuries were in fact psychosomatic psychological effects of people checking into hospitals because they were so panicked because there wasn't an effective not only could the fire department not respond to the physical consequences there was not a very effective governmental communications strategy in place so therefore exactly what the terrorists want to sow panic to create fear and no, intimidation the, the, I, I wonder though I wonder if when Great Britain had hearings and they had experts come and talk about the threat that Hitler presented in the 30s, they would have had a lot of people give you a hundred reasons why Hitler wasn't a threat. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day um, it dawned on people that he was one heck of a threat. And I, I wonder if it's the same kind of scenario here that we are, you know, kind of coasting along. and. Uh, you all are the experts. If, if you, uh, Dr. Hoffman, don't feel the technology exists, then I, I have to, to concede the, that it doesn't exist because you're the expert, but, but it just flies in the face of so much of what this committee has uncovered. Sure, if, I, well, uh, if I could just say one thing. <clears throat> it's not that the technology doesn't exist, and it's not that I don't think we should prepare for it. I don't think we should focus on that exclusively. If you ask me as a terrorism expert, what is the preeminent terrorist threat that the United States faces today? I would say a series of simultaneous car and truck bombings throughout the country, mm -hmm. which would cause panic, which would demonstrate the terrorist coercive ability, which would be easier for them to do. I mean, it, it, it wasn't very difficult, except they were caught, to bring, uh, a few years ago, I went down to Columbia because the DAS operation of Columbia, their FBI, uh, lost their building. It was exploded. It, it was, there was a chemical weapon that that basically caused 700 injuries and 70 people killed uh, in Colombia. And, and the, the question that I had there was it was agricultural chemicals. They took a big bus, they loaded it with agricultural weapons, and they blew up the building. Um, when you went into the, one of the tunnels, the Holland Tunnel, I think it may have been, but it was one of the tunnels in New York, they were simply going to take a truck with a, a chemical explosive, the car in front. They would stop the car, the truck had a corner. They would hop into their car and drive off, and it, the bomb would detonate, uh, you know, a minute or two later, and you'd have flames coming out like they were coming out of, a, uh, out of the barrel of a gun on both, both ends. I doubt people would take, go for it and use the tunnels much and mm -hmm. I mean that I that that can happen but let me ask you this what's to prevent them from blowing up a nuclear uh, a site a, a, a nuclear generating plant I mean do you have to be do you have to have the technology to, to have radiation go then what would be the technology you need Dr. Sulfo what what would it be I'm just a mister I haven't gotten the doctor well it, it's not it, it, to be honest you are what you are bringing out is what hopefully the terrorists don't think, and that's better placed bombs. Uh, conventional terrorism on new targets, which could cause mass casualties. A well placed bomb at an LNG, liquefied natural gas uh, facility, or a nuclear facility, or, or uh, uh, something lobbed into something else. Uh, yeah, security and safeguards at our nuclear facilities do need to take these sorts of threats into consideration. Absolutely. And, and you're right, it's, it's part, part, partially imagination here, and, and hopefully they, they don't become too imaginative. And that, again, is well, not I mean, to that's say... Really, you know, that's really kind of, you know, hopefully isn't good enough. I, I agree with you. And, and, we know that, and we know that that's not the case. I mean, you know, that they aren't, they aren't unimaginative people. I mean, we can joke about it, we can say it, but they aren't.
Well, I was actually referring yeah. to your comment. I, I, and I also agree that bits, bites, bugs, and gas will never replace bullets and bombs, as Bruce referred right. to either. But one of these could be a transforming event, where as tragic as a major conventional terrorist attack can be, that's not going to shake the country's confidence to, to the very core. So I, I, I agree. It, it is somewhat like looking at to, into to Hitler during World War II. It's, it's, it's finding the unexpected, not looking for the expected and trying to look for it within that noise level. It's looking for the thing that you're not looking for. And, and that is... That is a concern, and, and I think that um, uh, by all means, uh, one of these events, if successful, <coughs> could transform society. Well, yeah, and, that, and my point in asking these questions is then to, to ask the reasons why we're here for the hearing. But I mean, I, 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 I don't like to, to have experts come, and, and, and I don't want them to say it's going to be worse than it's going to be. And I think, Dr. Hoffman, what you're doing is you're saying, you know, you need to know the threat as it exists and as it might exist so you can respond in an intelligent way. I mean, I'm, I, I, and I value that tremendously, but, I, but, but I'm concerned that in the end that, that um, we will talk about this problem after there's an event, because I do think there will be an event. I don't think it will probably be nuclear. Uh, though, you know, if you speak to someone like um, um, my colleague, uh, Kurt Weldon, from uh, uh, Pennsylvania, he's concerned that the nuclear backpacks in Russia aren't all accounted for, and the Russians say they are. Um, but you know, I happen to to think that Kurt Weldon, who has made you know so many visits to the Soviet Union, has uh, has has a point that we should be concerned with. I, I have more questions, but I'm happy to. to My only thought, just the one question on that, is that we're so reliant on a lot of things that uh, work through satellite technology these days. What's our exposure and vulnerability of somebody deciding to, to go after satellites? Well, that, that is a topic that broadens the, the scope of the discussion today. And, and I do think vulnerabilities uh, to our space assets is, is a critical issue that the United States needs to, to look at and, and, um, and needs to take steps to harden those targets. And, and you could make the case, a, a very good case, that yes, that is part of homeland defense in the larger context. Uh, we, we are more dependent than anyone else on these forms of space we satellites. Look at how much we do have dependent on them. And, and, we, systems. and, and you're absolutely right. From a dependency standpoint, uh, uh, whether it's our national security information or whether it's telecommunications, uh, um, well, surveillance, we have radar, we have of things you, you're absolutely right, and that is something I, I do hope. Um, and, and looking at Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, thoughts in this in, in, in the past, I do think this is something you're going to see an awful lot of effort brought to bear, at least within OSD. You may even have, there's some discussion about a new Undersecretary for Space and Command Control Communications, C4ISR, Intelligence and Surveillance. So um, I think that with, with uh, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld in charge, uh, those sorts of, of concerns will be addressed and, and first, first priorities. But I agree with you. Well, I might add a comment. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that no one can say with certitude, none of us, and certainly none of, no one in the intelligence community can say that there isn't another Am Sham Rico somewhere out there that we don't know about who um, may be going to school on what, uh, on, the, on the Japanese cult. Uh, this is a, uh, an issue that uh, the intelligence community is all, often critiqued for. Uh, in other words, the, the dilemma is, do you only go on what is evidentiarily based, or do you go uh, or plan on what is theoretically uh, possible? And that is kind of the dilemma we're in here uh, with respect to um, potential terrorist attacks. Thank you. Let me um, be clear on this. You all have basically said, um, first off, you, you, you have responded by saying, that it's not a question of when as it relates to nuclear. I mean, I think you all have uh, made it uh, uh, agreed that chemical, biological may be a question of when, uh, but you, 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 particularly Dr. Hoffman and others reinforce it, are saying, you know, let's not lose track of what terrorists can do without having to use weapons of mass destruction. They can do a heck of a lot of damage. But you all are saying to, to us, and if you're not, tell me this, that we do not have a strategy, a national strategy, to combat terrorism. Do, is that true, Dr. Hoffman? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir? absolutely. Okay. Correct. Okay, and tell me in each of you, and you have attempted, to, you have done it well, but I'd like you to attempt it 
uh, in, in, a, in as succinctly as possible. Why do you think we do not have a national strategy? I'll start with you, Dr. Hoffman. It goes back to our assessment of the threat. I think we have disparate parts that we, that we don't completely understand, that it's led us, and this is a, a very personal view, it's led us to focus perhaps exclusively, or if I could say that more kindly, perhaps too much on the high-end threats and to ignore the entire spectrum. My concern is, again, how we would respond to an address to an Oklahoma-type city threat. I think certainly we've made tremendous strides in addressing the potentiality of biological or chemical threats. But at least in perhaps my experience is too narrow. But when I was uh, meeting with first responders in Oklahoma, Idaho, and Florida, the complaints I thought from three very different states were very, very similar, that they felt there were tremendous opportunities to get chemical biological kits to respond to that end of the threats. But things that they needed, such as concrete cutters, thermal imaging devices that would respond equally as well in. You just tell me a little bit more than I need to know right okay. now. Just so the bottom line is that why? We, I think we need a, a, str a strategy and I want to know a, on why? a threat assessment to plan against, and that we don't have a clear one now. And the reason, i just asking why. I just I want you to say it. You said it once, but I just didn't want to lose there's, track. There's not a net assessment or a process to gather together the differing strands from different agencies. Okay. Inertia. Inertia, okay. And can, that you did it very succinctly, even more than I wanted. <laughs> can you well, expand? Let me, let me suggest, yeah. if I may, sir, another, maybe another way to think about this. Yeah is that um, if you think of the terrorist threat in a, in a military context, if I put my former hat on, as a major contingency for this country, and the issue is whether we are basically, and I'm speaking broadly here, uh, still working with the legacy of the Cold War and the, right. and the structure we had to confront the Cold War and the, the bipolar contest with the, with the former Soviet Union. Now we're confronted with a very different threat, not necessarily nation-state-based, nation yet fundamentally the government is still structured as it was. So that's another attempt on my part to answer your question. Well, I think it's a, I think it's a very helpful one, um, frankly. I mean, we, uh, our, our institutions are prepared to deal with something quite different than a terrorist threat. And there are lots of implications, aren't there? There, there, there are implications that the military might have to say as important as this, this, and this is, this may be a more serious threat. And, and to acknowledge that may put some people, frankly, um, out of business or, or devalue in some ways uh, their, their importance to someone who may have a more important role to play in this new day and age. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, that's what it triggered to me. Mr. Worth, Worth, Worth? My opinion, Mr. Chairman, the answer is leadership, uh, specifically leadership from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the executive branch has the responsibility for developing national strategies of any kind. Congress can't do that. Congress can direct a strategy, but Congress doesn't have, a, have experience in, in developing national strategies. And part of the problem, I think, not to be too critical of, of efforts, well-intentioned efforts that have taken place, particularly in the years since Oklahoma City, but it's, it's a lack of recognition on the part of the executive branch about the nationality of this issue. Uh, it can't be fixed with a couple of presidential decision directives directed at a couple of federal agents. It can't be fixed by the Justice Department's view exclusively of how to handle this problem. It's a national issue. As General Clapper said, it's not just a federal issue. It's got to be part and parcel of a national approach to addressing the issue. And from, from my own perspective, that has not been well recognized by the executive branch to this point. I would like to, as I did bring up earlier, I also agree executive leadership is, is absolutely critical uh, and is probably the single most important element uh, and ingredient to actually seeing action on what we're discussing today. I, I also think that the different agencies that now need a seat at the National Security Planning Table has, have, has changed. Public Health Service, Department of Agriculture, unless we're using for cover, <laughs> were never really seen as uh, agencies that needed a front row seat at the national security community. And, and I also agree with, with Mike Wermuth's comments that 
there's a tendency to look at the world through your own lens, mm -hmm. through your own org chart, to look at the world's problems through your own org chart, when in reality you can't look at it through an individual lens, but rather a prism that reflects all these different views. But then again, that requires that belly button, that, that individual who, who can marry up authority, accountability, and resources. And, and I do get back to resources, the golden rule, he or she with the gold rules. If you don't have anyone who has some... No, that's some the gold rule. That's not the golden rule. The gold rule, forgive me, okay. uh, and not the silver, but um, it is, it, I, I don't I even have the courage to ask you the analogy of the belly button. <laughs> I, I, that, that's a showstopper for me. Do you have the courage to ask him? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> One um, point. <laughs> One point? A focal. a focal point, okay, that's good enough. Um, so we basically, you basically establish the problem exists. You basically uh, agree that the that um, that there isn't a national plan. You've explained to me why, and it's uh, and all of you have had slightly different responses, but they all I think are uh, helpful to me to understand because that can then enable us to, to to see how we work around that. So I get to to this last point of of each of you have kind of focused on the solutions. Uh, or, or how we should approach dealing with this problem. And I'd like you succinctly to tell me, is, 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 is it important whether we get in a debate or, it is important, I'm, I'll tell you what I've heard, that we, you know, the position Mr. Clark has uh, within the White House needs to be brought more out into the open. I mean, we haven't really been able to get him to testify before our committee, for instance, and have a meaningful dialogue, because he's, you know, not under our jurisdiction. So at least should be someone that Congress uh, has uh, the right to review and look at and question and all that. Um, and then the question is, does that person end up becoming a czar? Uh, uh, does he end up becoming something a little more different like uh, was suggested by, General, uh, by Senator Rudman? Uh, what, what is that? And so you've said it, but tell me what, is it important that the debate be about whether he's a czar or not a czar or so on. What's the important part? Well, uh, as far as the Gilmore Commission is concerned, we uh, uh, developed a great aversion for the term czar and uh, steadfastly avoided uh, using that term. Um, that doesn't, that implies, uh, I think it has sort of a negative connotation. Uh, what I think I would characterize as, as an authoritative coordinator who is accountable and responsible and has the ear of the president. With, with significant powers? I think, well, significant powers. Uh, in, a budget? Well, has to have oversight and, and visibility over all the agency budgets that, are, that right. we've got lined up here who have some role to play in this. We were very concerned that the, de the departments and agencies who, who do have, who are lined up on the wall here, do not abrogate their uh, obligations and responsibilities that they're now now charged with. We're not suggesting that or that those should be all subsumed, gathered up under one central organizational umbrella. That was not our intent at all. What we were suggesting that there needs to be an orchestrator, a quarterback, whatever metaphor you want to use, who does have oversight uh, and influence over the uh, allocation of resources and funds and can account for and address duplication, overlap, or omissions, where there is something that no one is doing, that this entity, and it has to be something more than uh, a, a very capable staffer on the National Security Council to do it. So it's someone that is answerable in the executive branch, answerable to the White House and Congress. A absolutely. It should be someone appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. So it, it, it is that, that personage is, is politically accountable. Dr. Hoffman? Congressman, my expertise is very narrow. I could tell you how to organize a terrorist group, but much less so. Though. But much less so how to tackle the U.S. governmental structure. I defer to my colleagues on that. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Wormuth, I would simply concur with with what General Clapper said with with the with the addition that it it it's not just a matter of taking the national coordinator's position in the NSC and elevating it to presidential appointment with with Senate confirmation. If you look at all the agencies on this table, it's more than just national security issues. When you consider the CDC and the other HHS functions, when you consider the Department of Agriculture and the possibility of agro-terrorism, <clears throat> when you consider some of the other aspects, it's not just an NSC 
uh, function as we know the National Security Council. It's much broader than that, which is why we suggested that this new director, this new entity should have oversight over all of these, even though there's still an important National Security Council uh, input and focus here. It's significantly broader and takes, of course, into consideration state and local functions as well. Mr. Salufo? Well, to be blunt, Dick Clark's done some very good work as a national coordinator. Um, I, I think that perhaps he's had too much on his plate. He's the coordinator for all things that go boom in the middle of the night, from cyber to CBRN to, uh, to transnational crime, drugs, thugs, and bugs, I guess you could call it in the vernacular. Um, the difference that I see is the need to, is uh, the ability to have some sway over budget. And, and this means certification and pass back authority in, in our recommendation. And, and additionally, that would require congressional oversight. Uh, you do want to be able to fire someone, too. Let's be honest here and, and, and get down to, I mean, when it comes to accountability, you want us to point a finger to see why we should be doing things, why aren't we doing things, and why didn't we do something. So um, I, I do think that it needs to remain within the executive branch, but within the EOEOP in the office of the president or vice president. Um, and and uh, while it's a coordinator, that coordinator would define the yearly strategy, the annual strategy, and budget should be uh, dovetailing through that strategy. And then they can even decrement a certain amount of, of an agency's counterterrorism-related budget if that particular agency isn't adhering to that. You all have been very interesting, very helpful. Um, is there a question that, that we should have asked that you would have liked to have responded to, or is there a question that came up that you think you need to respond to before we close the record? Sir, there is one issue I would like to bring up uh, since it came up in the uh, heart uh, in the earlier uh, discussion with uh, Senator Rudman and, and General Boyd. And that had to do with the issue of lead fed federal agency uh, and the implications uh, there. Uh, with respect to civil liberties. I would tell you that this is, was probably the, the most intensely debated issue that has come up in the Gilmore panel in, in its thus far two years of existence. It's an issue the governor himself feels very strongly about, and it's why we specifically uh, recommended in our uh, panel uh, discourse that uh, in every case, no matter how cataclysmic an attack, that uh, a, the lead federal agency should always be civilian uh, and, and never the Department of Defense. Uh, that's one issue that we weren't asked that I would like to address, uh, particularly on behalf of Governor Gilmore, because I know he does feel very strongly about it. I, I, can I just add sure. to that very briefly? And, and that the debate is normally cast as an either or, as if security and free freedom are mutually exclusive. I, I don't share that. In fact, I see them as enabling one another. Obviously, we should never in infringe upon liberties in order to preserve them, but at the same time, the American peop the, the American government uh, at the federal, state, and local level have a responsibility to protect American citizens and, and their livelihood. Look at how much we've spent on projecting and protecting abroad. I, I don't see why protecting us at the homeland, given the potential threat, uh, uh, should be seen as, as anything else but truly the very core of what our national security community in the end is all Would about. Would you agree, though, that it should be a civilian? Oh, yes. We, we, we did make, I did make reference in my testimony to the role of Department of Defense. Okay. I would, uh, but yes, I think it has to be civilian. But I also, at the same time, don't want the president to have to turn to that cupboard and then find it bare. Okay. So I, I would also say that many people think that DOD capabilities are arguably more robust than they are because of the civil liberty discussion. The truth is there's not a whole lot there either. We need to capitalize that capability so the president, who has the decision to then decide who, who, who's taking charge, has those assets and capabilities at hand if and when, God forbid, needed. Okay. Any other comment? To any of you? Uh, if I could have sure. one final word. Um, I think we should, and this is a much bigger picture uh, comment, uh, I think we need to resist the temptation to reflexively write off terrorists as fundamentally irrational or fanatical, as often has been the temptation sure. in recent years. I agree entirely with Senator Rudman and General Boyd about the resentment against the United States. I was in Kashmir last month and certainly firsthand witnessed it from relatively educated people, actually, in 
not even the fanatics necessarily, this anti-Americanism. But at the same time, I think if we lose sight of the fact that terrorism, even for groups like OM, who we don't understand, still remains an instrumental and a logical weapon. And if we misread and misunderstand terrorists, I think we risk not preparing for the threats we really face. I agree with you entirely about Hitler. My only difference is how Hitler would have attacked, not whether he would attack. Okay. Um, all of you have provided some tremendous insights, and I appreciate your patience in waiting to respond and your patience with our questions. Um, we're learning about this uh, every day, and uh, you've uh, added a lot to our knowledge. Thank you very much. So with that, um, we'll uh, adjourn this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>